work hard, party hard. No. I'd be the younger that is. <laughs> well, man. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So the process of sleeping is one in which all of these, you know, this broken proteins and bits of junk that are in your brain kind of filter out and you're left with only the things that were most important from the previous day. <laughs> so I can start off by asking questions. I want to do that. Uh, I, I thought today, the, the one thing that we didn't really cover yesterday, there just wasn't a way to do it in the back of the it's, it's more appropriate for the second day, is uh, talk a little bit about EM coupling issues and how it relates to uh, IP. So yesterday we we were doing the DC, we started off by doing the DC mean steady survey, right? Calculate, get the measure the voltages right at the, uh, at the final end of turn on, so if they, uh, your, your, your total fields, uh, take them, invert them, and get a uh, electrical resistivity productivity session. So that was, that was fine. Uh, we then made one more step to that. So, okay, well, if I'm going to turn this thing off, then there's actually going to be a transient that goes through, and that's going to carry some information about the electrical conductivity. So if I measured those data early enough in time, just on the off time, now I've basically got just a time domain EM experiment. You tend not to think about it sometimes that way, but that's what it is. So you, you've got steady state, and now it's just like, okay, I'm going to do a time domain EM, start with a constant current, turn it off, and I'm going to measure it my way. So it is an EM experiment. And it's just that that data is usually not used because what people are very much interested in that lot of time is the fact that there's actually an IP signal coming in. So it is from material being charged up, and you know that generally takes significant time, both to charge up and to discharge. So in order to capture that amount or that information, there's no need to really work with the early times. So people tend to sample, you know, initially it just you know, you know basically in a prime channel or multi-time channels or, or in a window that was significantly removed from that. Uh, place where you have EM coupling, that means you regard that as noise and just make sure that you start late enough so that you don't have that, or then try to find some way of doing that. Uh, so, what I'd like to do today is kind of take a step backward and, and I want to look at just this whole process and show you a way that at least that we have been looking to uh, get rid of EM coupling in a band. That is, you've got both EM induction and you've got IPK, and trying to separate all of those things is uh, it's, it's a challenge. It's still an ongoing challenge. What I'm going to show you is not you know, sort of God's gift to geophysics or the end of the whole story, but it is something that has worked for us, and uh, I think it's worth well showing. So, the talk, this was actually prepared for a uh, a keynote kind of for India, so there's a few things in there that we, we've already talked about. I'm just going to skip over them very quickly. If there's anything I'm skipping over that is of interest and you want me to slow down, show. But I think, I think there's a few things here that we just basically talked about yesterday. So uh, this work is all done with uh, Sandy Kang, who's finished up his, his, his PhD. Uh, he's also somebody who could have been finished ages ago, but got caught up with the disc, all the preparations, uh, and he's been a, a real important person in developing a lot of the numerical results that uh, I've shown previously and that I'm going to show today. So sorry, he's, as I said, he's finishing up his PhD. He was a co-presenter with me. He went to uh, South Asia and East Asia, and then he'll be doing a few with both Lindsay and I in North America. So the reasons for doing uh, 
uh, looking at this is the fact that electrical resistivity is complex. Remember, it changes as a function of frequency. Take a rock, measure the resistance of that rock, it does change with frequency. And then we put this through, uh, and honestly, as, as I mentioned yesterday, I, I still really like it. It's just, it's a way of kind of thinking about how things work. It's the same kind of thing about you know, electromagnetic induction, thinking about the coil system. It's, it's kind of representative, it helps, it helps ground you. And we get this uh, over voltage that comes in. So the moment that we put an electric field, sorry, too quick, but we start off with a completely neutral system, we put an electric field on that comes from any place, and that then drives uh, positive ions in one way, negative ions in the other way, they get kind of locked up and maybe some core growth, but the end result is there's an electric polarization. And we can do anything that we like as far as measuring some value of that. When we turn the current off, the uh, voltage initially drops, and then these are just all the effects of the charges. So we saw that, minerals. Here was our over voltage, here was our con we were interested in. And then this is what we did for looking at the data. Yes, well, maybe I should go back a bit just in case. So we collected the DCIP data, and then we take the DC data, invert that, get conductivity. And we take that, get a mapping that connects the chargeability with IP data and we can invert those chargeability data for this chargeability. Okay, two-step process. And we're going to continue with that two-step process throughout uh, this, this whole talk. There's other ways that you can attempt to tackle this problem by working with complex resistivity right from the get-go, but uh, this process is pretty stable. And then we saw these examples. Uh, with respect to you know, pseudo sections and inverting. So, what's our uh, what, what's our challenge here? Uh, we're going to we're going to look at two cases. At some level, they're the same, but there's some fundamental differences here that make them we uh, make them work well be treated individually. And we're going to first of all look at grounded sources. So this is this is what we've got here. We've got a current, it's a loop layout that looks like that. We're going to have a current go in here and out here. And then we're going to look at the voltages that we have obtained. And instead of having something that is actually looks like this, uh, there's going to be this negative transient that comes in here from the EM induction. <laughs> We're also going to look at inductive sources. And I'm going to take you back to something I mentioned very, very briefly. This was the Kimberlite deposit in uh, North America. So this was a VTEP survey. There were two, uh, two Kimberlite pipes. These were flown uh, with different time domain EM systems. The blue is a negative value, red is positive. And when we see these two pipes here uh, are really very different. Uh, this one has got purely negative decays. If we look at, well, first of all, if we look at PO at 27 here, so if we look at some plates here and we look at the sounding curve, then it's like this. It starts off at early time counts as positive, then it's got a zero crossing. And then it stays negative. This guy up here is just negative all the way. One of the things that, uh, again, it was a, a great paper by his, Peter Bidel. I mentioned his name uh, before because he was doing that fundamental work for the, uh, the airway for the Marini Amp. Uh, he also showed in, that for something like this, where you've got a basically a coincident transmitter receiver that the only way in which you can get a negative uh, portion of your sound maker is if there is induced polarization. What we're looking at here 
is induced polarization effects, and we see that they're quite different. This guy, that's all we see. It's just totally IP contaminated, whereas the sounding curve down here, it's got a positive part, so correct a normal induction, but then followed by the IP decay. So when anything is kind of happening like this, where we've got, you can see that we've got uh, you know, EM induction and chargeability, uh, you can appreciate maybe there's something going on here that's complicated and need to unravel. So what, what I want to concentrate on is, we're going to break it up into two parts. Well, first of all, we're going to look at grounded IP and then how to remove the, the contamination and uh, have an example of a gradient uh, array. And then the second is we're going to look for inductive sources. The physics is sort of the same, but there's enough differences here that there's uh, complexities that are involved. So we're going to simulate the data uh, in the frequency domain. Our equations look like this, and Ohm's law in the frequency is is just given by by this. Uh, if we have just normal uh, frequency independent data, as we were talking about yesterday, then we can also work in the time domain, and we can write this quantity here that j is equal to. Uh, the product of sigma times. So this is a uh, simulation of, the, of really the time domain data that doesn't have any IP effects. However, if the conductivity is uh, frequency dependent, so now we're, we're actually going to work in terms of, of frequency, so things are going to be tilted back to back. Uh, so this is low frequency, this is high frequency. We're going to use a cold cold model. So sigma infinity. Sigma infinity is the conductivity that the rock exhibits when you're having when you're passing infinitely high frequency. So it's an N and So effectively what that means is that there's no IP effect. So this is this is the conductivity of the rock that doesn't have uh, any contamination of IP The change in what's happening as a function of frequency uh, is often written like this. It's sort of a cold co representation. Eta is that intrinsic chargeability that we talked about. So that is actually going to go from zero to one. Tau is a time constant, and C is another factor that is used to help describe this. Do you think it's dry here? So here's a, here's an expression in the frequency domain. Tell us what this what this is like. But I could take the Fourier transform of this, and now I'm going to get something that looks looks like this, a pulse, and then it's got this big negative quantity in here. This is sort of your response function for, for the IP, and we're going to work, work a lot with that. Uh, an important thing here is that it's negative, which is also going to eventually translate into the fact that you know the IP currents are going to be uh, opposing the uh, fundamental currents in the, in the object. So we take the Fourier transform, and then that gets a sigma of t, which, which looks like this. So now if we go back and we look at uh, simulation of time domain data with IP, we actually have two, we have two routes. So we could work in the frequency domain. There's a j here. And we could put in j is equal to sigma only at times e. So that's still, a, that's still a multiplication, and we can carry through, and we can solve this system at each frequency, and then we could take a Fourier transform of that at the end, and then get uh, electric fields and magnetic fields as a function of time. That's, that's generally the way it's done, I think. Um, so most people who want to compute a time domain IP response 
well, first of all, solve everything. Everything had a whole bunch of frequencies, and then use that condition here, and then go ahead and uh, do the inverse transform. The other way, and this is how we're going to do it, we're, it's uh, uh, for an America result, we're going to use a code by Dave Marchak uh, at UBC, and we still have the same equation, but now when we consider to be have J, J is actually the convolution of sigma. So remember that <coughs> if we've got this guy here, J is equal to, or sorry, this guy, J is equal to sigma of E, then if we're going to take the Fourier transform of that, and sigma depends upon connectivity, then we have to use the convolution theorem, and that says that J of T would be sigma of T convolved with E of T. So that's what we've got here. So how does, how does this look? Here's our, 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 our system. So we've got uh, the asymptotic, uh, well, stabilized here, we've got a direct current. We turn this guy off, and we've got these, this negative transient that, that comes in, and here's our signal that has got uh, IP effects in it. So it's pretty small, right? You can't see that, so we're going to blow it up a little bit. So now we take this guy here, and we blow it up, and now we see, oh, this is negative down here, and then it slips up and goes positive. So here's your I, here's your IP, here's your PM, and here's your IP. So that's what we're going to try to look at. But how are we going to find IP data? The logical one is as follows: we'll take we'll take our observations. So the observations have got IP put on in them. And we're going to subtract off the fundamental. Uh, so the fundamental field is just the EM field without any IP effects. Uh, this notation, at least, we may have picked that up from Richard Smith. It may have been he may have got from something earlier, but I think it's now kind of standard to talk about this forward Maxwell data when it's uh, modeled with sigma infinity to be the fundamental view. So we're going to measure datum. It's one of these guys in here, let's say. And we're going to subtract the fundamental. So that means we need to know what this connectivity is. And then whatever we're left with is going to be our IP data. But here's what that's going to, uh, going to look like. The observed data are the black lines. So the black, positive, and, and, and negative. So we've kind of flipped sides here, just to try to help things, uh, just try to help visual prints. But the black are the observed. Right? So we kind of start off with positive values and, uh, and change the sign. And then the fundamental is this blue curve. And um, yeah, and then the difference between them is going to be uh, yeah something that we're really interested in. So there's there's a couple of parts here. One is that in the early stages, the observed and uh, fundamental are pretty much the same, and the difference between them, which is the IP curve here in red, uh, is is way down here. So uh, early stages, your EM in the EM induction regime, and you, you don't have a strong enough IP effects to really affect anything. At later stages, the uh, data and the IP effect are almost the same. So there's there's really no EM induction effect that, that's there. And then it's at these early stages, these intermediate stages, at which both things uh, are apparent. So th this is the basic three stages, EM, IP, and much that. So as an example of that, this is what we're going to do. This is the same example that you saw yesterday. And we've got uh, four different conductivities here. So this one was a high conductivity. That one was just the same as background. Uh, this is also high conductivity, but lower than that. And this guy's resistive. And all the blocks are, well, the two blocks that are chargeable 
but this guy here, and this guy. So, highest conductivity, uh, medium, neutral, and very resistive, and the two charge will block certain these guys. That's the kind of problem. See if you can sort that out. So, to set this whole thing up, we're going to use that same gradient array and uh, yeah, measure the electric fields at a whole bunch of dipoles, uh, a couple hundred meters, 625 points uh, here. And so we're going to use those as uh, data. We observed DC data I showed you yesterday. Looks, looks like this. There's the apparent uh, conductivity. And the observed data in the off time tends to, to look like this. So the, the black is the uh, observed, the blue is the fundamental, and the red is the IP. So if we look at, uh, at, at A1, for instance, uh, we have a fundamental that's kind of coming in that, that looks like this. Uh, A2, but these kinds of curves. So A1, there's, there, was no, there was no chargeability. So the, you know, the observed and the fundamental are going to be exactly the same. So the blue and the black lines are kind of coinciding here. The difference between them is this little red line. So there really shouldn't be anything, but I guess numerically there's just a little bit of stuff coming in, but it's three orders of magnitude down. A2 is, uh, was chargeable. And we see what happens in those early stages. Uh, we're here, fundamental and observed are basically the same, the chargeable. Uh, signal is, is way down here. Late times, the fundamental and observed are, are completely in accordance, and then there's this really time. And A3, which was moderately conductive and chargeable, has curves that look like that, and A4. Okay, so that's what we're up against. Uh, we've got a off time at uh, 5 milliseconds, and the voltages across the region look like this. Uh, 80 seconds, so, little, so that's early time. Um, so that's, this vertical blue line indicates what time we're actually at, and here's the, uh, here's the map for that. And a little bit later time at 80 milliseconds, it looks like this. So, and at 130 milliseconds, it looks like this, and 650 looks like this. So at, at late times, there, there's really no particular issue here. You're seeing you know, the uh, conductive, or the chargeable body here and the chargeable body here. Okay, so let's see what we can do with uh, EM decoupling. So we're interested primarily in this intermediate time where everything is, uh, it's kind of blocked up, and but we're going to do exactly the same thing. But we're going to have to uh, subtract the fundamental. That means that we need to have some kind of conductivity. So we have choices. Uh, let's just first of all do a, a base. So suppose we had the true conductivity. So suppose we knew what the true conductivity was. So this is like a, going to be a theoretical result. And we subtract that from here and get the um, get the IP data. Then, in that case, the uh, uh, the observation here's the observations, here's the fundamentals, and here's is the IP data. So this is this is at 80 milliseconds, which was kind of nicely in the in this band. And you can see how by doing that, we've got rid of this this effect here and have ended up with uh, something. That, Suppose we take that same time, but we use a different conductivity model. So suppose we just use a half space. Okay, so now take a representative half space. In fact, the it's there. And here's our observations. But now the, the fundamental fields just look like that. They're pretty blah. And here we go ahead and subtract that. And we end up with something that looks like this. So we still, now we really have this 
artifact here. This looks like a great big IP uh, body here, and that would be actually quite wrong and very misleading. So, half space is good enough, we're going to need to get something that's a little bit better than that. So, how do we go ahead and estimate this uh, background connectivity? Well, we have a couple options. We could use the late time DC resistivity. It's not such a bad idea. That would be what would ordinarily be done. You'd use that for your DC resistivity. Go ahead and invert that, and then maybe, uh, maybe do that. The other possibility is that in this region in here, where the EM uh, signal was completely dominated over any IP signal, the observations are essentially EM. So we could take these and invert those to get a connectivity kind of structure. And in reality, we'd probably use both of them, but for now, I'm just going to kind of step through like, okay, if I did this, or if I did this, then this would be. So the uh, in, in inversion methodology is just the same as we've been doing forever, and what we did yesterday, too. So it's just a standard uh, inversion. In this case, uh, again, we're going to need a depth weighting if we use DC resistivity. And uh, the DCIP inversion has been done with SIMPE, the time domain inversion has been done with uh, a UBC. So here's the 3D DC resistivity inversion. I showed you that yesterday. So we pick out the uh, two conductors. There's the resistor. I uh, have to use depth weighting. Oops, not bad. Good. Good to go. And if we do the decoupling with that, uh, here is now our predicted fundamental. We're using the uh, conductivity from DC resistivity. So it gives us something that looks like this. So importantly, we've got this signature in here, and we take the observations, we subtract that, and we end up with something like that. So that's actually helped uh, immensely. Uh, kind of got rid of a little bit of this at, at least, so it's uh, it's definitely a big step in the right direction, and it's also kind of uh, adjusted what what this anomaly is. In here. So there's de definitely been some positive things that come out of that. And if we compare that with a half space, we're up here. So what about the 3D time domain version? Now we're only going to use the first six time channels. Use these time channels, and we're going to invert them and get out a, a, a conductivity. So I do that, and I end up with this as a, a conductivity structure. So this was actually the same, again, the same images that I showed you yesterday, uh, essentially. So here we've got our, our two conductors. So if we take that and put it in. Now, Here's our predicted data with that conductivity, and we uh, subtract that from the observations we get this. So this is this is kind of cleaned up that anomalous uh, target here, really pretty nice. And if we compare that with the uh, DC uh, DC value, uh, we can see if there are some differences. So if we look at the comparisons uh, for getting the IP data, here is the true. Here is the half space. Here's the DC resistivity. And here's the type of medium. So you know, that's what we're trying to get. That's what we get with the type of medium. So anyway, that's pretty good, right? So that's the first step. We can't think about inverting unless we've actually got the data. So now we've got the observations. We've modified them by trying to get rid of the EM coupling. And we're kind of set. So that's our inversion workflow. Uh, we first of all invert time domain data, recover the background conductivity, compute the uh, IP responses. Now we're going to work with linearized equations. We're going to use the same linearized equations that we used for uh, just regular DC. And then we can invert those to recover the pseudo chargeability. So we're going to follow exactly that same one. When we do that, uh, 
the here's the true chargeability. So these two guys were charge voters. So it's plan do, it's cross section. Using half space, we've got this anomalous target out here, which was quite wrong. Using DC resistivity, get this, and with the time domain data, we can get that. So you can also look at these things by uh, just doing the volume cutoff. And there's there's really not a you know, a huge amount of difference, but the point is, uh, this actually is, is, is a very viable workflow. There's just a little bit uh, fewer artifacts on here. And the thing about this in this case is that, again, there was no, in order to get anything out of the DC, we had to use the depth weighting. Um, here we didn't have to do that. But I guess the take home is that. Uh, you know, traditionally these early time data have been discarded, but we could use those to get a better estimate of both 3D conductivity and then by doing this subtraction, uh, what the total uh, charge ability is. Yeah, any questions about that? Who's uh, what have you been doing for removing the info? Or is that? I mean, that's that's got to be a huge problem. That's it, right? Did you guys party all last night? <laughs> uh, hello. How about where's my gold star bells? That's why, because we are sitting at the back. I know. <laughs> it's like, late today. I know. That's a good plot. Come on, then, David. So, what do people are doing? In my shallow data, we just chop off the, the portion of data straight out to the current scene on or off and just discard it. Yeah, you chop it out. And then, but okay, so even if you chop it out, then there might be some portion of that that still has. You might think it's contaminated with uh, the induction effects. I mean, do, yeah. do, do you try to do that? I mean, do you try to fit? You know, at one point, people used to try to fit cold, cold parameters to the induction part so that they actually have a fine response. It's kind of like two cold, cold parameters. Right? One for the IP, one for the EM. What, what, what people do? They just use very low transmit frequencies so that the collective duration will do us to. Does that work all the time? Can you do a lot of frequencies? Generally, you put one to five hertz, three to four hertz, one to seven hertz, and it's quite a lot of So, because I've been looking at the last time, and uh, you'd be looking typically at the last second of the off time, right? Two second off the time, so you've got to pass most of it. So I guess the you know another motivation for us is you know, not only uh, get distinguishing like okay so suppose you get one time channel that's that, that's laying up this pure IP I mean you could actually go ahead and uh, you know, invert that to get something some information about about the plot and try to filter it. But we keep coming back to this uh, holy grail of uh, spectral discrimination and trying to see if uh, we can actually determine something about differentiating rocks because they've got different K costs. And which means that now, now you really do want to have data that sweeps as much of that time span as possible because you might have some rocks that are decaying quickly and you might have some that are decaying slowly. And if you don't have enough, uh, you, you know, bandwidth in the late times that you're collecting these data, you, know, you, you still find okay, there's something chargeable, but it's difficult to so carry that information one step further and decide like, oh, that, that might be this kind of wrong. With that. I mean, that's that's still a long way to finish when you're doing that. But I, I think that's kind of where we like to like to go. So taking taking these kinds of uh, of surveys and working with them really hard to extract the most valuable information that you can out of all portions of that guy. Uh, 
uh, is yeah, definitely a goal. There's something on this aspect. Um, in, in the shallow uh, geophysics world, there's, there's a lot of information, a lot of work on soils and, and highly effective clay. Now, generally, people do their field work and they come up with a, a very confusing result when they look at clay with um, uh, IP. And some say you get the biggest IP effect of 10% clay, things like that. Uh, so it doesn't fit the cold coal model. Um, I'm thinking that there might be a lot more work to be done along the lines to say um, to clear up this position of clay because clay is also very conductive. Um, so it's not going to give a bio EM effect. Um, I don't know of any work that, where the EM effect has been taken into account in clay studies. Well, I think in all of these cases, you know, it's all a maturation process, right? You, you start you start off with a, a certain uh, survey, and you're able to get some information, some data from that, and you're processed it somehow, and it comes out of the conclusion. Then the equipment gets better, and uh, you know, survey techniques gets better. You know, at some point, really what you want to do is to you know, be able to put that input current in, know exactly what's going into the ground, and then be able to look at this at responses at very early times and very late times and all the times in between. And then now you've got your full suite of responses. That has a lot of information. Different parts of that curve have different are, are more relevant to specific kinds of questions. But I think if we as a you know as a geophysics society go forth and really have that kind of end goal in mind, this vision like, okay, we're going to put in this, we're going to, we're going to take high quality measurements of every part of that signal, and then we're going to use it to often on them. That should help us. Anyway, so that's what happens with grounded sources. So in a grounded source, put the currents in it, and then you just let things build up. So asymptotically, you've got this nice uh, final voltage with everything being charged up. And then you turn things off, and everything is okay. What happens if you fly the system? Now you don't have grounding points. Things are changing. There's not been nothing happening, or you know, there's nothing that's been possibly asking so, oh, you don't have a DC down. You know, what, what do we do? What do we do with that? How do we think about that problem? You've got different amounts of uh, sensitivity, different high and low IP effects, uh, pixels or voxels, and different. Uh, Different coupling points along the survey. Um, I guess the, the the way it comes out is through through the different combinations of coupling with different voxels. That if some have got high IP effects, some have got low IP effects, and you're still left with some equivalence. Yeah, there was a lot that you said there. I thought was was very relevant. Anybody else got comments? So suppose that you, uh, you're you flying a bird and you've got a, uh, yeah, you've got a loop source in, you've got constant current, and then you turn it off. Okay? Then you're going to get EM induction effects in the ground. We've already figured that. How does the IP, how does the IP figure into it? How's the ground going to get charged up? You can be a little bit more explicit. <laughs> well, um, you'd, be, you'd be excited charging particles and they induce the current. Uh, and you turn, and that signal is now turned off. And so you're seeing the response curve on the back of that. Okay. No repairs. Pardon me? 
when it reverse then because you've charged it up so you've got a hole and then when you turn it off there's nothing keeping it like that so we'll try and go back to me. Right, okay, yeah, so that, that part of it definitely is on the whole the whole question has to do with charging it up. How 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 are we thinking about that problem? Okay. You're the pixel. Okay, you're charged for. I'm sitting here, I've got transfer root, I'm turning it, turn it off, and now I've got an EM induction field that's going through. Right. So what you see at your location, if I if you plotted the electric field. Okay, you might get some, you know, high value, and then low value. Right? Good. That's that's my electric field. What is the electric field? The electric field is the forcing guy for you know getting things polarized, right? That's that's how we, we saw. I think it's membrane polarization. I put a little electric field on you, then immediately all those charges start to kind of polarize up and. Uh, but here's the big thing with the DC, you know, ground source versus not source. If I'm in a grounded source, then my electric field is constant in a particular direction. And that means the charges are going to fill up according to that constant pressure, and we're kind of good to go. So it's, it's kind of simple. In this case, yeah. You're sitting there, this electric field is coming in here, you now it's this way, it's this way, this way, right? Stuff's coming in later, right? And at each moment in time, okay, when you've got an electric field that's coming in, then you know you're you're, you're starting to build up charges, right? So immediately you know, something comes in this way, the little strength, okay, you build up the charge, then change well, you know, that might discharge, build up here. Right, so you can see that things are really chaotic, and especially as you've got strong time variations of the field, and you've got to worry about your own time constants, because you might have a particular time constant, let's say a millisecond, to, to, to build up. But if, if my electric field when you is only on for a tenth of a millisecond, you don't even get a chance to build that up, right? And then something else is happening over here. Um, yeah, there's lots of stuff going on. But still, at the end of the day, there's charges that are built up because we, we saw that, right? So this is, this is where I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm especially pleased with the work that uh, Soggy has, has done. We, uh, we spent two years trying to figure out, okay, how do we work with this stuff? In the end, once we figured it out, it was like, oh, that's not so hard. We should have done that early start with it, but uh, we didn't. Uh, basically, what we've, what we've done is develop a technique where we monitor for each pixel, we look to see what is the electric field as a function of time, given, given that you know that background conductivity, what's the electrical field as a function of time? And then we pick out that time at which the electric field is a maximum. We're saying, well, okay, that's the, that's the guy who's charging things up. And then uh, we use that particular direction as the direction for which something has been charged up for that particular transformation. So that was the big thing. And then, of course, this all gets lumped through because. That's what happens here. If I move the transmitter over here, now the electric field is changing, charge field is changing, everything is changing. So if I got multi transmitters, you can see that things kind of could get complicated. However, if you do that, I'm going to show you an example. I believe this is the first 3D example that has been done, certainly that I know of, for uh, recovering chargeability. From airport data. Lots of people have realized that, oh, there's 
you know, chargeability effects in airborne data, and they do something in general, kind of do something that's that's one D. And you know, maybe it actually works okay. But there's there's nobody that I know that has taken this problem, dissected it to the extent that we have, and kind of made a general three D uh, inversion for us. I'm not sure that. So we're going to look at um, inductive source IP, and a field example is uh, Tliquat Choke. Is that too bright? Can we turn the lights down? Okay. Well, it's so as I said yesterday, uh, so here's uh, Tliquat Choke. We call it TKC. Uh, it's got two pipes one of which is under a lake, and the other which is dry. Uh, the pipe structure looks something like this. Uh, there's different units. There's a hyperbissal unit, a cat plastic unit, pyroplastic unit, there's lake sediments, and there's lake. So what happens is that um, you get an eruption from, from very deep, explosive, we get materials, including diamonds, because diamonds are uh, stable at very high pressures and temperatures of depth, and they can get carried up and, and remain stable, and they're found up in this, these different units. In particular, for this particular pipe, the pyroclastic unit, the PK unit, is the thing that is really of interest. That turns out to be the guy who is uh, diamond difference. Then, because things have kind of blown out, right, we got this you know, a bit of a hole, it's filled back in, and there's often a lake there, and there's often sediments. A diagnostic feature for uh, finding these guys is looking for uh, electrical conductivity. Sometimes it comes from the, the pipe, sometimes it's just the lake sediments. Um, we have argued vociferously with Theo Aramanis, uh, who claims that Everything is just due to the lake bottom sediments, but uh, I don't believe that, and we'll show you why. Anyway, we fly a DHM data, remember, DHM, frequency domain, uh, Q, quadrature, okay, all these things are good, 7200 hertz, uh, flying in lines over here, and here's the signal, so actually it's DO18 that shows up very strongly, and here's the The uh, airborne history here is, is really fascinating. So the was done in 1992. And then in the early 2000s, uh, Aerotam flew, uh, flew this. And so here is this big conductor, right, from there. And then they flew the Aerotam data over top here and uh, got this negative, negative value. And they're like, oh, what's going on here? Because you know, here you've got a big conductor, so you think there should be something really, you know, really pretty positive. You're expecting a big conductor, and you see one down here. I remember the uh, SEG meeting at which the Aerotown one day that were presented, and people were just simply scratching their heads and said, I, I, I don't think that could be. It's got to be an instrument problem, and then. Some people in order to interpret it, you wouldn't believe what you do, right? So some some people said, ah, there must be something wrong. Let's just take the absolute value and proceed. Right? Um, yeah, don't do that. Uh, so Aerotem was kind of betwixt and between. So they said, okay, we're going to build a new system. We're going to be an upgrade system, and we're going to go back and apply this. They went back. They flew it. And those negatives came out even stronger and had far less noise on it. So that seemed to say, like, oh, this is repeatable and it's high quality. VCAM came along the next year, did exactly the same thing. So unquestionably, these are really, you know, early time negative values that were that were having. Uh, there is also a, a ground-based data. We're not going to talk about that, but it just you know, again shows this is the nanotem data that. Um, yeah. 
So how, how does all this work? There's a, there's a little movie. This is uh, Dave Marchette's movie. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to look at this situation here where we've got a conductive chargeable block. So it's buried, so it's 100 ohm meter, uh, half space here. Um, and we've got a, uh, a block here that we're going to take a look at. Here we're going to have a, uh, a transmitter loop that, that's sitting up here. And then we're going to measure the, uh, the transient sounding, which is going to look like this. So it's going to be positive and then negative. But what I want to show you on here is the nature of the currents. We're going to see two types of currents. We're going to see the in induction currents from the EM induction, that those are the guys that are going to charge things off, right? And then we're going to see those polar, so then they're going to flip through, but then the object is still charged. And now we're going to see the discharging currents for those, uh, for the charging button. So you see now this is exactly what you'd expect from yesterday, right? And here's the curls. Let's do that again. Stop. Okay, so we've got a transmitter uh, up, up in here, and so the currents are you know, kind of going. You know, in and, and out of the in and out of the board. But that, so these are the induction currents that are going out, and, and they they started underneath here, and they went down and up, right? So that's what we did yesterday: smoke rings. But those currents, if I've got this block down here, and those those currents are actually going to uh, charge up the, up the block. So that's still the induction current. Now, now we see these polarized. So now we're we're looking at the current in this block. Okay, and now we can see that there's you know, polarization currents. So they're they're kind of going around, but they're going in the opposite direction. And it's the, it's the fact that they're going in the opposite direction means that you've got this negative uh, negative response. So the positive response comes from, you know, currents basically go one way, and then you get this negative response uh, that can be caused by currents going in the opposite direction. Yeah, and then they eventually everything is Yeah. I guess we had some stills. Okay, so that's that's the physics of what's going in there. So now they now at least the thought process, like okay, I, I kind of get it. It's, it's not all that complicated. It's just you know, <laughs> I have the time varying field. It's, it's going to generate you know. Time bearing electric fields everywhere that's going to cause charges to be built up. Where those charges are going to be kind of depends upon the strength and the orientation of that electric field. That's going to be changing with time. Uh, but in the end, I might end up with something that is still, uh, you know, it's still very short. It really is. Uh, the, uh, the paper that we wrote, uh, it's published in Geophysical Journal International. Uh, we were extremely pedantic in looking at every possible assumption that we could make in this and trying, because you still have to make some assumptions and trying to evaluate what condition these things were and stuff like that. So it really carries through, it, it really carries through everything. But one of the really nice pictures, I don't have one here, uh, is that you know it shows in, in cases where you've kind of got a grounded, grounded system, you know, how they, 
you know, the polarization currents, they are just equal or the opposite in direction to a partner current. Uh, in this block example, it shows, you can see that, okay, these are actually vortex currents. So you've got chargeable, your, your charge, uh, charging ability currents, your polarization currents, are actually circular now with, within the block. So in a galvanic system, so again, this is, is important. It kind of takes a little bit of time to wrap your head around it. The, uh, in, in a galvanic system where you have this DC resistivity and uh, currents are going through the block, you know, then your currents are kind of going into and out of the block, or at least in that direction, or at least uh, polarization currents. But in a, in a inductive system, I'm induced, it's like you have before us, so the current, the induced currents are like this, right? right? So they're going circular. You have a plate, currents are going like this. Well, that's where the polarization currents are also. So they are actually really vortex currents inside. So different. different so Doug, yeah. why, um, so you, you saw a reversal in the top part of the, uh, the DO18, why didn't you see a reversal in DO27 when you did the same uh, airborne so Is it because so of the different orientation of the body? Nope. Uh, we shall, yeah, we shall come to that. Oh, Good question. Okay, so we've kind of laid the groundwork. Uh, now what we want to do here is to first of all find we need to find the conductivity structure and here this presented some problems because if here's the VTEM data set and remember at uh, early times if I'm up in this region in here uh, everything was negative so our uh, like okay so here was our good idea right take the early time data invert them as uh, as TEM and get to conductivity structure, right? Good to go, except there's no early time data here that's positive. So kind of, kind of, kind of hooked there with that. But we did have uh, ditch M data, okay? So we actually used a combination in a kind of a cooperative inversion. We took all of the soundings here that seemed to have substantial positive values in the early times, and we took these guys here, and we merged them together, and we cooperatively inverted to get a 3D conductivity model that actually looks like this. So on plan view at 311 meters elevation, it, it looks like that. So it's a very conductive body here, and a lesser conductive body here. And if we do a cross section, we get something that looks like this. So the conductor kind of comes up to the top. Interestingly enough, this conductor here stays uh, stays buried at, at, at depth. Okay, so that's our conductivity model. So what happens now? Now let's see how we can use that for, for, for decoupling. So let's take uh, a fairly early time, 130 microseconds. So here's our observations. Okay. And then we're going to take our estimated conductivity that I just showed you. Do a 3D forward Maxwell on it, compute those responses, that's the fundamental response. We're going to subtract this from that. And that's going to give us our IP, uh, IP response. So this is a decoupled data channel. And look at the differences, right? This guy here, sitting there, has basically you know, been kind of wiped out, and we're left with almost nothing there. And then we've got three other places, A1, 2, 3, that all seem to be, that all seem to be chargeable. Okay? So that's, uh, that's now a decoupled data map. This is the IP data that we actually want, and that we're going to subsequently uh, use to. Uh, 730 microseconds. This one's this one's really, I think, uh, impactful. Okay, this is 410 microseconds. Here's our observations. Okay, so now we see. Ah, wait a minute. There's something. Looks like there's something chargeable in here. But we already had the 
kind of had that guy back here. There's something happening here with A3. So we've got this. A1 is pretty chargeable. And A4 is, is sitting like this. But when we do the uh, forward modeling of, of this, so our conductivity structure, is, is up here, we do the forward modeling, get this. And now if I subtract those two things, here's the data, here's the decoupling. So that has been a, a huge uh, cleanup of this whole area here to give us something like that. And now we see we just got some whomping big uh, chargeable uh, feature down here. Okay, so that gives us A1, 2, 3, and 4. So now we've got now we've got our decoupled uh, data and we're going to we're going to have that at many different time channels. And so we can invert each individual time channel so that's going to give us a three-dimensional volume of pseudo chargeability at that particular time. So what are we going to get from that? So at 130 microseconds, a bit earlier, we invert those those data, and we get something that looks like this. So we get a really high chargeability up here, here, here. So A1, A2, A3 up there, and uh, here's yeah, that is cross section. At 410 microseconds, the spur is, is really quite different. Uh, this is this is no longer the dominant kid on the block. The dominant kid is this guy back here, and he's he's the main charge field. So there are certainly things happening as a function of time, the different uh, <laughs> different charge field case, and that's undoubtedly telling something about the the, the different problems. So we can do one thing. Uh, so we have. And different channels of data, and so now we've kind of unraveled everything so that now at you, at your pixel, we've got 10 different estimates of the pseudo charge relative, which is kind of intrinsic to intrinsic here. So I could, I could analyze those pseudo charge relatives and put them into some kind of cold co model and get out the uh, cold co parameters. So I can do that. U, your pixel, U, U. So for each pixel, I can go ahead and do that. And when we're taking values, so we're just going to use pixels, of course, in places that have chargeability. So A1, A2, A3. So we take a number of pixels from, from, from each of these. And we go ahead and we invert them uh, with a cold cold parameter, assuming that. Uh, and, we, and what we're interested in is trying to find both eta and tau. So on this axis here, we've got tau, so that's the chargeability, or the time constant. And on the vertical axis, we've got chargeability. So there's a couple of things that, I mean, the first major thing is like the separation between here and, and here. So clearly these rocks over here corresponding to A4 have a, a, a big time constant. Uh, the rocks over here, A1, A2, A3, uh, all have small time constants. Uh, but you know, they, there, there's some hint here that you know, we could push things a little bit farther. They almost seem like they're grouping a little bit more. I, I wouldn't want to go too far in that speculation, but uh, you know, just just by looking at this, there, there do seem to be some some grouping. So what we're, what we're starting to see here is that you know, individual rocks at individual locations might be having different kind of cold, cold parameters, and that is, you know, might be important. Now, A3 and A2, are they underwater under lake as well? Uh, a, I, think the, I think they're on the side. Somewhere on this side. Yeah, That's a good question. Connectivity in the um, S3 or says at the bottom of the lake. Uh, yeah, that's a kind of a good note. Well, here's the lake outline. And these, this is 
A3 out here. So some are outside the lake, some are in over the lake. Does that? I was just thinking because the uh, tide, the uh, EM response is stronger when you have to make sediments. The, the clay in the bottom of the lake, would they increase that? The tide, the tide factor? Well, we don't actually. We don't believe that those lake sediments are playing much of a role at all. We we did a lot of hypothesis testing. We did a lot of things, and our contention is that the higher conductivity is actually the pyroclastic unit beneath the clays and the ocean or sediments at the bottom of the lake. Yeah, a little bit conductive compared to folks, but they're they're not uh, they're not affecting things very much. Okay. Yeah. Could you just go back to the previous slide? Oh, you mean the one with that background? Yeah. Yeah. Now A four is is uh, coming at a different time signal, and that those sediments are all underwater. Could it be that those materials are deep, more deeply weathered? Oh, uh, yeah, I have. I have no idea of all that. Right. I, I, I believe the first part of that, they're coming from, from deeper. Um, the cores that we have that are going through uh, DO27, uh, there's definitely variabilities both from top to bottom. You get this pyroclastic unit inside, so there's lots of clays in that, and the clay distribution changes from, from top to bottom. So what I see is that there's this pipe, okay, we've got Kind of that characteristic shape of uh, you know, a little, little bit of water, some sediments, and then there's kind of a conductive unit, which is this pyroclastic unit. It's both conductive, so there's clays in there to make it conductive, and they're also chargeable. Uh, that's about as far as we can push it. These guys here all come from you know a few cells that are thought to be representative of. Yeah, what's actually causing how those things are, why those things have a really large time cost. Yeah, I think they, I mean, they're pyroclastic, they're bigger particles, and then there's weather effects. I mean, so it's not unexpected that they have a different time constant, but exactly what that is. So, can, can you, I'm thinking, I'm a bit confused, like, what's the significance of the time? Like, so how come you go from earlier time where it was A1 was more charge than A4 or bottom yeah. less, and then the later time switched. But is that so that, and that's a rock property? Are you saying that like the decay is longer for A4 rocks, so they're going to hold the charge longer? Is that for a rock? Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's right. Yeah. So, I mean, suppose, suppose that you do an analog charge, right? Okay, so I'm going to. Yeah, okay. Charge it up a bit, put an electric field on you, but you you each got different time decays. Right? So in you know if, if you have a really long time decay, then you're gonna be hanging out there more, right? And so you're going to you know that's going to be the dominant characteristic that so does it stay strong and get but so shouldn't A4 be strong in the start as well at the early time as well as we're measuring the K, yes. So if you actually look at the strength of the of the polarization field, they're just going down. But there's a question of uh, how quickly they go down. And there's this question. So what you're looking at for an amplitude is determined by this scale here. So on this scale, uh, these A1 rocks or actually have more chargeability, uh, but they also decay faster. These guys, you know, still have very significant chargeability, but they decay more slowly. But but the important thing about this is that it's it's saying like, wait a minute, there's there's two, there's at least two different kinds of rocks here, which is interesting. So we were. Well, Sorry, can yeah. it only be explained by like 
Yeah, that, I mean, we know that the only reason that we can have uh, these negative transients on these airborne data is that there's an eye So, uh, well, we can't think of any other, we can't think of any other uh, plausible physical explanation for why we're getting these, these negative transients. That's more than amazing for a instrumentation. Uh, loop moving at a, at a pretty rapid speed, really, probably eighty knots or something like that. Um, you know, the, the direction of the currents which are being generated by the loop are going to be flipping, but then over stacking period, you know what I mean? Like, like the long ones are going to be acting against each other as, as you're actually moving along from the front and the back of the loop on front and back of the circular current flow. So, uh, probably, yeah, I just kind of, kind of quite see how the, how the charge is being built up. In that. No, even in, in, in a loop, I mean, sure, maybe there is some time for, you know, current to get around the loop. Maybe that's just more instrumentation. Anyway, I, mean, I, I, I think I, I view this as I've got a, you know, a, a generator on here, and I, you know, I put a current in through that loop, and that's um, that, that's happening. Very rapidly compared to any kind of time scales that I'm interested in, which maybe the earliest time scale might be I don't know, a microsecond or something. But how, how long does it? If I, okay, so you've got an 8 meter loop, and now you, you, you push the switch on the generator, how, how long does it take for the current to go around from the positive to the negative? A lot of instantaneous is just more of a transmit and um, ramp up time, I suppose, is the distribution of the instrumentation. But I'm just thinking that as the loop's moving, um, you know, for a given point in time, you do have currents going in one direction, but then the loop's, the loop's moving a little bit, in which case the, you get a reversal of current flow um, by the time it's moved position a little bit. So it kind of counteracts the the current flow from that position before, but all this is happening very, very quickly while the well, you're transmitting it probably 30 hertz, I suppose, in the case of big things. I mean, I'm not doubting, I just find it amazing that you can, that, you know, get a build up of charge within that time period, given the stacking that's going on in particular, I guess, it's amazing for me. Yes, I and mean, things are, uh, you know, they're getting more and more complicated, and there's more pretty pretty quickly i mean if you look here this is this is the long time period okay so that's three that's 300 microseconds or a thousand microseconds so it's like one one millisecond so that's getting you know that that's getting pretty long in time compared to what your uh, base frequency is but you're still you're still, you're still actually charged, you know, getting a pretty significant amount of charge that could have built up in, uh, you know, in a millisecond. So, what is 30? So, if you had 30 hertz, what does that give you? 30, does that give you 33 milliseconds? Well, you're, you're, you're talking about. Uh, you know, the time that this thing is actually on and then off, right? So it's on. It's about 9 milliseconds off time. Pardon me? It's about 9 milliseconds off time. Yeah, so, and, and 8, eight milliseconds off time too, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's that's fine, 8 milliseconds. So this stuff here is, you know, in the order of a millisecond or a couple of milliseconds. So that's completely consistent with the idea that, oh, as far as you're concerned, yeah, it's, it's basically been yeah, no movement of my my, my transmitter, uh, and I'm going to have time to charge up. If if my if my tau constant is in the order of a millisecond, and the on time of this thing is eight milliseconds, yeah, I'm probably good enough. Right. But that's that's a good point, and and actually what that means is that if you had if there was another rock out here. Okay, at uh, you know ten milliseconds or twenty milliseconds, you're not gonna see that. Uh, it's out of phase with the. Pardon me. It's out of phase with the signal. 
Well, you're, yeah, you just yeah, you just don't have time to charge this guy up, right? So he's going to need a certain amount of time to charge. So there's uh, on this end, you, you you can't do much more. And on this end, right, if you've got uh, something that's got a, uh, a a decay constant of you know a microsecond or something like this. Uh, Again, you're not going to see it. You don't have enough time sampling. You're not early enough time to, to do it. So uh, there could actually be more rocks out here. Actually, the, the more complicated thing is ice. So ice has a very fast uh, dielectric constant. These, I kind of think ice is kind of falling someplace in this region in here, or maybe 10 to the minus 5, uh, you know, 10, 10 microseconds. So it's, it, it's going to be a challenge on an airborne system to get things that are very fast time constants and very long time constants. And those fast, short, and long are in connection with how early you can sample in time and how long your initial pulse is uh, on before you're, you're switching it. But you do have a sweet spot. Right? There's, there's a time window in there. And I think there's a lot of rocks that kind of fall Perhaps within that uh, within that time. So what we're able to do with uh, with this is to put this together with uh, density susceptibility and uh, actually generate a rock model that has different rock units. And I was saying yesterday that uh, you know each of these guys. You know, it's got particular combinations of the various physical properties, density, susceptibility, conductivity, and then early time chargeability and late time chargeability. So remember I said we inverted the uh, early time chargeability model. Basically, it gives us a 3D model. Okay? So it's a 3D. So you can kind of think about that as you know, physical property. And then the same ones over here that uh, have uh, you know, the late time. So I've actually got five volumes from which to work with. For each of those volumes, I take a pixel, I look at all the physical properties, and then I decide, oh, you've got this combination of these. Uh, you're going to be rock unit one. This combination is rock unit two. And, and that's how we build these up. We use a fuzzy C-means classification. There's a lot of work for us to do and for other people to do on this. It, it's not, uh, uh, we feel like we provided an exact procedure for how to do this, but it's, you know, first pass, reasonable, not, you know, might get 80% of the stuff. So here's our geophysical rock units that, that we've got. And then, so this is from, from geophysics, and then this is the uh, the model from drilling. All the dots are, 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 are drill holes, and uh, you can see the, uh, you can see the correspondence between them. So the green here that we see here, it's not what's known as the PK unit, the pyroclastic unit, and that is the guy that's done the difference. So he is, knowledge uh, yeah, yeah. about him would be gray. This red is the VK unit, the volcanic plastic. Uh, XVK and VK are kind of similar things, but they're just a little bit, uh, uh, they're a little bit different, but they're basically the same kind of rock. So even though they're different colors here, it's telling us the same information. So uh, yeah, we're pretty good at that. And uh, kind of matches that. So in summary, uh, we have a workflow for decoupling, inverting, and estimating parameters. And uh, the, the big thing is this intermediate stage in, in here. Uh, our first was to invert, to recover the background conductivity in a grounded system. We ended up with something that looked like this. In an inductive system, we ended up with something that, that, that looks like this, right? So either way, we can get a background conductivity. Then we're going to compute the uh, IP response. So we take these conductivities, do a forward maximal modeling, subtract them from the observations, and we end up with, for the, uh, for the ground source, we have this, 
for the inductive source. So we invert each time channel for a, uh, a, a chargeability, and for the grounded source, we end up that, the inductive source this. And sometimes we actually carry it one step farther and then take those <coughs> results that you did for the inductive source and uh, use that maybe to distinguish uh, rock times. You make that presentation available as well? Yeah. Yeah, there's actually this presentation. I'll, I'm not going to do another one for you, but there, there is a uh, there is a whole tutorial that we put on with respect to developing a, uh, you know, a geologic rock model from geophysics, which basically has, in one way or another, has kind of got all of the stuff sort of that you've seen, except what it does is actually builds things up. So we start off with uh, uh, density. Let's see that. You have gravity radiometry, and you start off with density, you invert that in 3D. And you know, what can you see? It's low density, high density. So you, you, know, you basically get a background and Kimberley. And then you start adding susceptibility to it, and you find out, oh, wait a minute, there's a, there's a rock unit, this HK unit, is very susceptible. And uh, so that's like, OK, that stands out. So now you've got And then you've got electrical conductivity that uh, is added in, and then you've got two volumes for chargeability, and then you put all of that together and come up with these things that you have. And the point about the last the, the last image in that tutorial is that it just shows you like, oh my god, if you could have, if there had been an opportunity to take those airborne geophysical data as right up front, then the analysis, I mean two drill holes would have been amazing. Right, because then you'd have a geologic log, bit of physical body. I mean, you'd have such a good idea on, on what, what to do. The uh, the TKC is kind of interesting from just historical perspective uh, because it was at the height of the Canadian diamond rush, and you know, everybody was going out there staking madly. You know, it was it was crazy. Well, you've you've seen very rushes here in Australia. So you, that's not there wasn't, uh, you know, you find a little bit of kind of positive uh, indicators that, there, that there's diamonds there, and uh, you, know, you, you hype things up, but everything is, you know, the prices of shares are going up, everything's And then, uh, you know, rather than sort of say, wait a minute, let's, let's do some due diligence here, and let's, uh, let's so it been hyped up, and then without kind of doing things properly, they said, okay, we're going to go to bulk sampling, right? And so they went through and bulk sample, and they got disappointed results. Well, it was, there are some things that happened, like just, they are the tipping point, right? So this whole market had been bubble, 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 right? And then suddenly this TKC stuff comes in. Everybody had fantastic expectations of it. And it turned out the results didn't prove that. So that went down rapidly. And it was just the thing that was needed to tick off the whole market. So the whole diamond market in the Vancouver Stock Exchange, Johnson, London. So it was, it, it's kind of, it's got some like interesting technical theories. It was important for, for many reasons, but honestly, if they had done even some of the, uh, the, the simpler version, just the gravity and the magnetics, uh, they, they had the geologic model really quite wrong to start with. They, they were initially thinking it was, they were basing it on a South African Kimberley, right? And that wasn't transportable. So they had, uh, you know, basically a whole region at one time that was just, uh, just, uh, they thought it was just all one big Kimberley, not um, two pipes. And yeah, it, it's it's just another case of being overzealous, overselling, 
not doing due diligence, but really if they had inverted just a couple of this data, they would have they would have spotted their initial drill hole someplace differently. They would have learned a lot and you know, would not have uh, gotten into trouble. So that's, that's why we're kind of uh, interested in this. We're, we're trying to, well, we wrote three papers published in geophysics uh, interpretation. Yeah, hopefully geologists sign on. We'll see. Anyway, that's. Uh, that's really all that I thought uh, really like to tell. As I say, we've got lots of other things to say, but what I'd like to do now is to switch. Well, maybe grab a quick cup of coffee if it's there, I'm sure. Uh, and then switch over to uh, presentations by people. So, how many people have got something prepared? Oh, so one, two, three. Seven, eight. Nice. That's great. Uh, so maybe while we go for coffee, uh, people, if you have them on a thumb drive or something like that, we could uh, put them onto onto our computer so that we just work easily. The other thing is that we would like to just capture both your presentation and your slides. So we'd like permission to use your slides uh, and whatever you say. If you do, if you are uncomfortable with that in any way, just let us know and we will hear it. But uh, yeah. so if, if you're comfortable, it's great that we can share. If you're not comfortable, just let us know. It's no good. And for your presentations, if you could just include your last name in the file name, um, that'll help us keep track of. I'm not sure if I've got this. So I've just. So it's It's going to be different okay, if yep. the, there's IP in there or if it's right? So all you're trying to do is. Oh, it's already in the cloud. Yeah. Get rid of uh, <laughs> trying to be as fast. Um, <laughs> and, and, and why is it far up? That's all right. I mean, it's kind of a 
Because okay. well, in tennis in EM, it has been used in many ways. You yeah. with MT so community, that's yeah. something else. Uh, uh, so you, you no, but I'm not sure what phonics yeah. means. Yeah. So there's also, I think it's like mainly pictures anyway. So. Okay. If you want, you're welcome to change it to a PDF. Yeah. And, and so you think, oh, well, that's just it. Like, um, yeah, yeah, maybe. Usually, but it's kind of Yeah. There's still some. There's still some residual. Right? Maybe contamination. Is that possible? Yeah, I'll just check. It was 60 megabytes, so I had to press up the JPEG file. Okay. I don't know if it's a PDF, but I don't know if that would work. It's in the last Oh, um, um, so I don't know, I didn't know how to show up. It's okay, that's a little bit of resolution. But I think it's still so, yeah. so, so, if you want other thing that you can do that will transfer a big file is to send it through Slack. Um, <laughs> okay, so if you, you just go with that one. Right. Right. It looks good. That's great, so that's yeah. 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 Perfect. Perfect. Um, options. Can we issue the charger? Which one is it? Lens? Is that one? It's probably easier to do it on that one. Oh, yeah. Perfect. Yeah, that's the end. I was wondering for the JPEG stuff. I was very discreet. Wasn't it really awesome? Yeah, But is that possible a chargeable um, source? If you want, that, I know it's that to the GF. And then if they come up to our other PDL, I'll just get it. Okay. Is there anything else that you were? Oh, I see. Uh, no, the rest of it's come up. Okay. Well, so I want to start showing the it may be stressivity. That's very different. No, you'll need to do it on your own. You know, you've got to find a charge. So, charge is something that is chargeable. It's not chargeable. No, but you can still see it. So measure something. Yeah, yeah, I was true. Yeah, yeah. The other thing that's really simple is so you go ahead and you do the inversion, and now you get. You, you, you get something and it's like, oh, that's yeah, different than what I've got another bond, and it's swallowed through, and then the same stuff comes, right? I'm suspicious. Is I'm that suspicious all the time. Good. That's good. <laughs> good. <laughs> good. Suspicious. The invention is very, 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 very tricky. Very <laughs> it is. You know, a lot of people feel like, oh, I'm not just Oh, I know. Red. Is that okay? But yeah. you get the part, mm -hmm. like you take your 3D model, right, and you've got your suspicious stuff. Yeah. Come on. I just take it, get rid of it, replace it by something in the background. And now you get a different model. Then you just pull this out. Can you see this 3D and 3D? Can you check the head? Which one is it? Well, we've got it. Can you see it? Can you see it? Can you see it? Go down for that. Yeah. 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 I thought it was just a public direction. Go down for the file. 
Oh, that's this one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to be perfect. Oh, that's fine. He's going to sell just make them out. Oh, yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Jim, it's induction hazard. Mm. Good. Uh, yeah. I'll double check the <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, it's a very Canadian thing as well. Oh, is it? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
effect of having a gradient array out there. Um, since um, we're recording all the time, we also get off-time information. And you know, we integrate into channels. We can do whatever we sort of like. But we're not super fast sampling. We're 0.4 of a millisecond generally, or 2400 hertz. So we don't get the really, really fast sample like you get on the airborne systems. And we do get some interesting data. Um, what it means, that's probably a question for Doug. Um, it's quite confused, like it's quite interesting and confusing and hard to understand. Like it's not something I understand properly myself. Um, but this is our first channel after switch off. So you get a fair bit of information. You've got some cross cutting um, features in here. The liniments are still here. And it basically you can sort of see it progress through and different things become uh, evident in the data. But, so it's pretty interesting that this was collected fast uh, with a magnetometer um, <laughs> and we're able to glean a lot of different information about the structures in this survey. Now this is not inverted or anything at this point, like this is just plan view, like we know there's conductors, um, but we don't know the depths, we don't have um, from the MMR, we don't know <laughs> how it's how many odd meters or anything it is. Um, it's the SAM itself is a relative measurement, if you like. Um, yeah, it sort of goes through. Um, so you can sit here all day trying to figure out what's going on. Um, we are at the moment trying to get more information out of our SAM data. This is something that's been happening more and more. Um, so there is a push to be inverting this more because getting more out of the data is becoming more and more important. And, and as, he, as views change, um, as we get smarter and use our data in better ways, there's more that can be done. Um, so we're trying to do joint inversions um, <coughs> between our MMR and our EM to create a better picture with our data um, to help um, you know, our clients. So it's something we're always working on, trying to improve our system. And we've been reaching out because we uh, we mainly collect the data, we you know process the data, but we're not interpreting the data. A lot of our work comes through consultants, and they tend to take on that sort of role. But uh, I think this is where a lot of the exciting stuff is, and where the future is, and being able to you know use our on-time and our off-time data to put it together to create a map. It's it's you know, got a lot of possibilities to you know, get a lot more information. So. But that's just a brief overview of some of our SAM and some of our data. So that's, I guess, all I have. So I have no idea how long that was. That's perfect. <laughs> so but yeah, just a, some few pictures. So. Yeah. That's great. And those are, yeah, those are kind of exciting data sets, right? Because you've got prescribed magnetic field, but yep. on time. And about stuff that's going on at the transit. Yep. Um, it, from a, a collection you put, <coughs> like it's it's always nice to have at least two polarizations. It is. If, if you're going to try to do that with SAM data, like, is it like kind of two separate surveys, or can you yeah, can you set uh, you know all the current electrodes up and kind of be at one place and just you know, switch? We, we've current. thought about doing it both ways. Like you know, do you sort of split the line direction and try to you know essentially have a switching of your transmitter electrodes or um, to essentially try to highlight both directions at the same time uh, but then you don't really want to be walking on strikes as like, well, you sort of walk at an angle what, what do you do where's your compromise um, in that but so at the moment if you were to do it say you know I guess properly you'd end up having to do you know double your duration if you like if you walked it north south and if you walked it east west um, you know, we you know with two sets of electric uh, transmitter pits. Um, oh, I see you. Yeah, no, that, that's the way we do it. At, like at the moment, if someone asks us to do two orientations, we're essentially doing two surveys. Yeah. yeah. So we, we don't have, um, you know, a dive the multiplexer or something on our loops or whatnot. And we haven't played the sort of you know, key waveforms of different duty cycles or something to highlight the different directions. But yeah, we've thought about it, but it's, I guess it hasn't happened as of yet. So, 
it would be really nice to get the full picture because you know there's plenty going on in the other direction that you just it's lost it's not seen um so if you know nothing about an area it can be rough because you need to set up one way um, so yeah. usually have a little bit of an idea about the geology but yeah it's like we see the you know absolutely the dikes or whatever that are coming through east west there's not that much response from you can see the breaks so don't know if that's something to the wish list Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I think that um, one of the benefits of SAM, of course, is a rapid acquisition. You know, but typically, with the acquiring data of um, maybe one crew for many kilometres a day, so it's incredibly fast compared to doing one um, feed. And it's very high resolution. We've typically we've worked with uh, station spacings of something like you know five metres for the EDM model, or mm. potentially IP. Um, given what you've been talking about with extracting IP from the airborne again survey, this has got to be pretty easy. You've got, you've got um, um, you know, fixed transmit uh, loops for a start, not moving loops all the time. Um, is, it, is it possible, I guess is what I'm asking, even though we've got a very strong EF response in this case to actually um, go IP out of it also. Another data set. Just a look at the K constants. <coughs> Yeah. It's a much lower transmit frequency than you're talking about with air morning unit. It's typically looking yeah. at probably you know, four hertz or near about four or eight hertz. So you've got much more of a case to look at and much better stacking. You'd have to think it would be pretty you know, relatively easy compared to the yeah. I mean, it's certainly worth, worth, worth trying to see what, what could they go under under what conditions see the IP effect. But uh, yeah, I, I think these are great. I think these are great data sets. And also, the thing I like about it is that, okay, it, it kind of complements what's usually done. Because you're just measuring the fields and you're seeing what what information you can get out. And, uh, yeah, it's just like the LSA mm. example we showed yesterday. This, this is but one of the nice strengths so, right here. Yeah, One of the restraints I've seen the same is the fact that it's a uh, multiple component of data set. I mean, you, you, if you just look at the magnetics there, you get a certain view of the interpretation, but um, you know, add the connectivity to it, it's, it's quite a different interpretation. Like, obviously, the more different data sets you've got, the more chance you've got of making a, a valid, um, less ambiguous interpretation. So, exactly. um, yeah, that, that, that's what I see as a Perfect. Thanks, Chris. No worries. Thank you. Right, so who's, who's next? Yeah. Oh, okay. oh, too slow. Oh, you're too slow. <laughs> <laughs> right, and which one is yours? Uh, Alan. Yes. So this one will click through, and then this is uh, the laser one. It's just going to take a second to launch it. Yes. All right. Um, yeah, one of the projects I've, I've got is putting together this AgTem system, which is just uh, totally transient, transient electromagnetics. Uh, um, just trying to get a cart that really works effectively for toad transient electromagnetics. Um, we've got a, a big loop on the back here for the transmitter. Uh, in the mid plane of the cart, there is a receiver loop, which has got a, a bucking arrangement on it so that we can knock the amplifiers up a bit. Um, and the, this part of the Transmitting loop is fairly rigid and it doesn't move much, so that we can try to keep that bucking fairly stable. Whereas the bit out here, what flops around as you drive, but it, it doesn't make much difference to the bucking. Um, starting to experiment with sling ram out the front here as well. That's a great picture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, I'm looking down from on top there a bit, and you can see that shape, the transmitter loop. The front parts out here, they're, they're elastic, so I can come up to a gate or something and, and um, 
and the, the, the booms that can either be pulled back or if they hit a tree or something, they can just brush their way back and then spring forward again um, and yeah, try to get it to pack up to, to make it shippable to get around. Um, so I, I use a few different configurations. Sling ram um, on the card, an old receiver configuration with a bit of bucking in the middle here. Um, this is meant to be 3D. That, that's actually sitting on a different plane from this. And uh, trying to get shallow information out, uh, uh, a stack of three three loops on the core of the receiver. So um, the centre one's null coupled with opposing uh, opposing direction transmitter loops, and the, the bottom loop has a a lot more coupling with the ground than the top loop. So it's just a, a means of trying to get shallow data out of out of it. Um, and looking from the top again, and uh, yeah, the, the sling ram I've just started mucking around with that, and um, that'll become a lot more refined as we, as we go on. Uh, sort of data that comes out, I, I first plotted up as just as 3D data along course across ground. It'd take uh, paths of opportunity, so whichever way the paddocks are ploughed, that's the way the strike of the survey ends up being. Um, this one for groundwater. Uh, there's a plan view, uh, do the inversion, shallow data might show some meandering channels um, and deeper, you know, so, some deeper features that in this case have been searched, you know, it's a search for groundwater extraction points, so uh, that's 32 to 64 metres deep. Um, I, I can, do, you, can you go back to that previous slide? Just yes. So now, uh, what, what are we looking here? You're trying, where, where were the groundwater points that you were thinking about trying to? Oh, uh, deeper, deeper sandy alluvium. Mm -hmm. so, so there's a more saline weathering of basement rocks. Um, and the deeper alluviums coming out is more resistive. And what's your scale? That? Scale. Readable. Uh, you can see the, the Sydney to Melbourne freeway there, and there's there's a house. Okay, so, so four or five kilometres something. Yeah. Uh, yeah, a few kilometres across. Yeah, it's one day survey, one and a half actually. Uh, this is sort of uh, scenarios I end up surveying. Resistive alluvium aquifers cut into confined basement, just like the one we just did. Um, they're the best, they're the easiest to see. Um, yeah, alluvium on this side associated with the current river channel and uh, conductive basement weathering. Uh, some sling ram and in loop data inverted. Um, next one's usually where there's lava flows. People think, yeah, alluvial valleys, but they don't often realise that a lot of these valleys have lava flows that have come in and clogged the things up, and then the alluvium try to flow around the side. So I get a fair few of them. Oops. There's one where the lava flow flows through. Looks like something cut through it here. So yeah, people. When, when, the, probably a big big message here is that people want to get a groundwater study done. They think it's simple, but when we go out and start <coughs> survey it, it's complicated. And uh, the more detail we can put into it, the, the, the more they're likely to understand what's really happening. If they're trying to do a groundwater model, the, the model's just going to be wrong if they don't get the detail in it. Um, the next is uh, very confusing when you've got trying to pick an aquifer on top of uh, resistive basement. Um, what have we got here? Four metres deep. <coughs> oh, yeah, all right. Um, I'm baffled there. I'll put them there. It's the circularity of that. That's a, that's a centre pivot. Pardon me? It's a centre pivot. 
Um, Sorry, I didn't catch that. What is it? The center pivot irrigator. The the, um, the 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 servo was done in circles because it was on a, the 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 plow has gone round and um, plowed in the same path as the pivot moves. Um, I think something's gone wrong in the in the, in the um, PowerPoint there. Anyway, I'm not quite sure. Uh, all right, um, conductive pollutants. Um, I get a, a few few of these jobs where we're meant to find conductive pollutants. The, the government's always got pretty strict. Um, demands on how much pollutant can flow from something and it's often very small compared to the natural sources. So I find again the detail is really important because uh, invariably you get sail on faults and things that are under a site and if you don't have them well mapped then they look like escape of conductive pollutant when in the actual fact they aren't. And uh, of course those things are normally confidential so you don't get one of them. Another thing that happens Often find structure, uh, basement structure affects groundwater um, uh, aquifer positions. Uh, you get something here like you've got linear features here that's all, all to do with basement rock pouring. Um, they often show up. Um, sometimes you got, get to do uh, just positioning rocks and things around quarries. Um, very close line spacing and uh, the hard rock starts to show up quite effectively. Um, another one, limestone quarry. Um, there's the quarry over there they wanted to know in advance. That's uh, um, conventional electrical resistivity top tomography on this side. This side's uh, ag -tim. So that's two hours acquisition. This was about a, a day. Um, they tried ground penetrating radar too, which it was just too shallow. Yeah. Um, Can you go back? How did you do comparison with the DC resistivity? So we've got this uh, more conductive block on the right. Yeah. Conductive block there. Oh, okay. Um, which is focused into that. It's, it's, it's coming out a little bit different. Um, I'd say this one's come out a bit shallower than that one. But, um, yeah. And uh, the ones no one likes with the is where you've got the conductors on top of the resistors and you're looking for the resistors. So that, that happens quite common, commonly too. So this one there where the conductive soil on top of resistive aquifers on resistive rock, and you yeah, might say drill here. Probably the best prospect. Um, challenges. Um, it needs to fit down through gates and narrow narrow corridors so it can fold back. Uh, it needs to pack up for, for transport and uh, it needs to be very capable of handling the, the terrain and end up needing to, to travel through. Uh, and Ideally, I'd like to see go to, to doing 3D studies where we might have this as the transmitter. It can have a couple of high booms on it. It can have three three components too. Um, couple it with static receivers sitting on the ground, stacking all the time. Uh, move it through the system, and then just gradually leapfrog the the receivers across to get a, a full 3D data set with coupling from all different angles. Um, and uh, that could go into 3D inversion, and uh, I'll, yeah, I think that's probably a good way it could go for, for deeper work. Um, that's about it. That's very nice. I'm sorry, uh, I didn't catch your point in uh, the transmitter loop, that picture. Yeah. It, I mean the the, the, the instrument. Way. Is this the transmitter? The, loop? the the orange orange parts of the transmitter loop. Yeah, it goes back into there, goes around the top here, back out and out there. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Ye
so if you see there's a transmitter, receiver transmitter will work that is what we explain uh, maybe the second slide is a transmitter. Yeah, two transmitters, transmitters and the Oh that one? Right. one. Alright, so what one there's another transmitter loop in the top and one in the bottom. If you if you put the current through in opposite directions, yeah. then so on the center plane there should be nothing coming from the transmitter loops. The only response you should get is from the ground underneath. And yeah. the ground will be mainly charged up by the bottom one, not the top one. And uh, the top, as you go deeper, they'll start to cancel out. Okay, so what does this, um, that's made of everywhere. Will they influence the uh, magnetic field? I mean the, the instrument at the center. Yeah. If you give the current uh, in the loop, whether they will influence the uh, magnetic field in the receiver. Uh, you're talking about metal in the card, or that's all part of us. I mean, uh, uh, that is in the middle of the the, the loop. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that one. I'm sorry, my English is not that good. So, uh, do you catch my point? I mean, the instrument um, <coughs> in the center of that. that the middle loop. loop. Yeah, yeah. The middle loop is a receiver loop, so it has to pick up. I the think there's something. Uh, there should be something in the middle, right? So many things. Yeah. Yeah. Will they influence the uh, magnetic field in the receiver? Uh, that, that if, is you, the receiver. if you feel current, there should be magnetic field. If there is something uh, in the middle, whether what material? It it's all fiberglass through there, so. So they don't. Yeah, this, um, this shouldn't be anything to really um, build up a field. Of course, the yeah. practice is. You know, there's a little bit that the wires from the transmitter have to come down parallel to each other, and but, um, not much. Getting the from the vehicle, no? Yeah, yeah, we're getting effect from the vehicle, and um, I can, I move it out. I've got the draw bar out that far because I can't detect the effect of the vehicle uh, on the back loop on the on the on this middle plane loop at that distance. If I move it one uh, one meter closer, I can start to detect it. But if I move it two meters closer, I can strongly detect it. You can, you can draw a curve down from there. Um, so undetectable on that one. The front one there, that 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 still detects at that at that distance, and that's it's it's down and about the noise level at that distance away. Uh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, you have two transmitters uh, up and down. Uh, so how about the response you? Uh, because the two transmitters, the magnetic field will also goes up down to the and down the right. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you uh, deal with the response with two different size magnetic field? Uh, well, the, the the bottom one, yeah. if you go a long way down, I'll cancel out because they're different signs. Yeah. But directly below, uh, the 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 bottom one has a, a lot stronger effect than the top one. Uh, yeah. Um, it, don't get too excited about it because the current electronics are not fast enough to really sample very well in the time period that's needed to get that shell information out. So it's, it's, it's set up that way, but I'm finding unless you've got conductive soil, um, you don't get a lot of that shell information out. You probably need a, a four, 4 megahertz system to rather than 1 megahertz. How heavy is your trailer? How yeah, heavy? Too heavy. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah I've, I've got to work on that undercarriage a lot to get the weight down and um, get the suspension working better. But um, it's, it's about 120, I think. It's not too bad. Yeah. Oh, the early one was 50. But, yeah, at the moment, that one's a bit heavy. It's trying to make it a lot stronger, but got to yeah, pay for it and wait. <laughs> Oh, good. Perfect, thanks. Get that off there.
Oh, it's okay. Yeah, right? It's amazing. So what were you like as a kid? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I I don't have a beautiful presentation, I just have some images that I threw together last night, so apologies. Um, this is essentially a project I'm working on uh, as part of the work I do at the Geological Survey of Queensland. Um, for anyone not familiar with the area, this, this is actually where my project set, sits. I'm down off the southern extent of the Mount Isa in Lyre. Um, these this green and pink colours are overlying cover basins. So this is um, the Mesozoic Aramanga Basin, and you've got the uh, near Proterozoic to Ordovician Georgina Basin. They both sit on top of the um, prospective rocks of the Mount Isa in Lyre, but on top of that, um, there's actually a interpreted suture between the rocks of the Mount Isa area and possible extensions of the Tennant Creek Davenport province that come into Queensland in this sort of orientation. So it's actually quite a complex area geologically. So it, if you trace um, the Mount Isa fault, which comes down through here, which obviously is associated with the Mount Isa mineralization, there's possible extensions of that sort of geology. So it's complex, but actually reasonably interesting in terms of prospectivity. Um, so we've got a project in the area. Um, so this is our MT data set. This is only half of the MT data set. These are the broadband stations that we collected. Complementary to this, we've got uh, two high resolution blocks here and here of AMT data. They're just a profile rather than a grid. Um, but that's because they're horizontal spacing. So these stations are spaced at two kilometres long. Is 500 metres. So they're two distinct data sets, but they're complementary. Anyone not familiar with MT? The difference between broadband MT and audio magnetic lyric data. Broadband is lower, uh, typically lower resolution, but it's lower frequency whereas the AMT data is high frequency, high resolution data. So broadly, this is a bit more detail of the geology of the area. The Aramanga Basin units are in pink and the Georgina Basin are blue. There's actually a significant geological difference between these two basins. The Aramanga Basin is full of siliciclastic rocks, whereas the Georgina Basin is dominantly limestones in the area. So there should be electrical um, contrast between the two basins and then Obviously, there should also be contrast with the basement. So what we've done is there's a number of studies that we've kind of embarked upon out of this data. The end goal is a full 3D geological model of the project area. But in order to accomplish that, we're, we've broken it up into parts. So we've done kind of a, a depth of basement study or a basin study from the MT data so that would be all the AMT data and the shelling parts of the broadband data. And then we've done some more regional um, tectonic scale models to try and constrain what's going on deep. And we're just working on what's going on in the middle, which is the interesting part. Um, unfortunately, there's really poor geological constraint in the area. So this is all of the drilling that hits basement. Uh, these are mineral holes in the circles, and then we've got petroleum wells that are named. This is a deep crust of seismic transect down here and through here, and then can't really see it, but there's a company seismic data set to, uh, in this area here, which unfortunately doesn't actually hit any of our data, so it's not of great use to us. Um, and then the contours on this map here are existing depth to basement studies. So this is a, essentially a magnetic depth to basement study. These contours um, 
are the, the actual depths. The coloration on here is confidence, where black is confident and anything else is doubtful. Um, so you can see there's quite a lot of issues with some of these depth effacement studies that already exist in the area. And then this is the OSC base interpretation for the area, which is too low resolution to be useful. For the uncertainty about there, how was that, how was that calculated or computed? So essentially the way that these are done is the black hole, the black locations will be where there's drilling constraint. The drilling constraint is assumed to be absolute. Um, whether it is or not, it's up to us to debate at a later stage. Um, so most of, you can actually see the data points of being used to calculate this depth debasement. And these are all magnetic magnetic depth source solutions. So it's like a naudium um, solution or an Euler solution. So they're not, they're not entirely false, but they're not that certain either. So the, the certainty is calculated based on the source of the depth information. So obviously in here, there's nothing. So it could be anything. Um, so that's a little bit of background. I whizzed through that really quickly because I don't know if anyone actually cares. Um, <laughs> if you've got questions about the project area, come and talk to me. I'll chew your ear off about it. Um, so these are some reasonably typical AMT inversions. So this is the shallow information. So I'll show you three inversions from down here and three inversions from up here. This should be quite shallow basin sequences, but down here we're at about 600 basins. Um, so it, it's nice coherent data. The inversions come out quite well. Um, these RMS values are a bit high, um, largely in the low frequency data, which means the models aren't actually enough to properly fit the full frequency data that I put into the inversion. So in, in this range of depths, the data's been fit very well. Um, so essentially what we're seeing is there's Aramanga Basin sediments on top. The Aramanga Basin sediments are siliciclastic, but they're also mudstone dominated here. So they're actually super conductive. Um, for anyone who's familiar with the area, these are equivalent sequences to Bulldog Shale, which is in Eastern Succession cover sequences um, up around the other part of Mount Isa. So they're, they're, they're very productive and they come out really well in inversion. Um, they're very tightly constrained. We've done a number of sensitivity tests. They don't really vary in their depth. Um, but you can see this typically just a really thin layer. These are the southern inversions. These are the more northern ones. In the northern inversions, you're not seeing any Aramanga Basin sequences. What you are seeing is this very, very common sort of structure. So this is all Georgina Basin under here. This is all Georgina Basin as well. So there's a very typical two layer Georgina Basin conductivity signature. Um, and initially the thought that we had was that this is the limestones, and then as you go towards the deeper parts of the Georgina Basin in the area, there's more sort of plastic rocks, which should have an elevated conductivity. You know, this is kind of a, a good story, and it works right up until you look at the geology. Um, when, when you actually plot up the one drill hole in the area that goes through one of these sections, it actually goes through this one here um, in about this location. This whole thickness here is all limestones. There's a little bit of siliciclastic at the bottom and the basement's actually here, which is not really where you'd interpret it. If you just looked at these sections, you'd go, oh, yeah, that's basement, that makes sense. Doesn't actually make sense. So what we did um, is we went through, and I'll just flip back a second. <coughs> so the thought that we had was that we could use this very sparse drilling data to try and work out what's going on here. Unfortunately, these are minerals holes. And so this one here is logged as a kilometer of limestone and this one here is logged as not much better. The minerals guys don't actually care what's in the basins over the top of their rocks, so they don't log it very well. And they don't do downhole resistivity. 
So we stepped away from the direct project area and stepped out to a couple of these petroleum wells under the assumption that petroleum explorers care a lot about the basin sequences and they'll probably log it very well and they all do downhill resistivity. So it gives us a better data set to try and understand what's going on in terms of geology in the area. So I'll show you some results from this one, um, but I've also done synthetic modelling with the Bean Tree Well and the Bradley One Well. So this is the kind of modelling I've done. What, what we're trying to do is this is the logged geology and then this is the measured resistivity and then from this I've made a synthetic model essentially which is I've, all I've done is directly average this downhole resistivity data to generate this model. So it's not, I'm not really not really interpreting it, I'm just breaking it up into sections of consistent resistivity packages and then averaging that block. So that's why there's more blocks than there are geological units. Um, and then once I've got that synthetic model, I generate synthetic data and then I invert my synthetic data with any technique that I think might show me what's going on with the expectation that these inversions should resemble this model, um, which obviously they do to some degree. I thought 1D modelling would be really good because it's a 1D data set, right? So magnetic generic data has different dimensionalities. One dimensional data, one dimensional inversion, you'd think that that would be all right. The problem is, so this, this dotted line is the input model. These gray lines are different inversions. Each one ran to one RMS, it's all you could hope for in an inversion. Um, the blue line is the maximum number of layers I used. The green layer, uh, the green model is the minimum number of layers I used to fit the data, and the gray is everything in between. So essentially, if you had one dimensional data and then you ran this set of inversions without knowing anything about your area, you have no hope of interpreting geology, which is disappointing um, and kind of concerning. Uh, so we took it to two-dimensional inversion and thankfully we get a bit better result from this. Um, what I've done is I've done one inversion with AMT frequency band and one 2D inversion with broadband frequency band. So you drop out the very highest frequencies and then see if you can still reproduce um, features from the basins. And Pleasingly, these inversions are very similar to what we get out of our real data. Um, so you can see Aramanga, well, this is an Aramanga, but you can see a resistive uh, conductive package on top, and then a resistive layer, and then a conductive layer, and then basement down here. So this gives us some indication that these inversions are working, but it, it still doesn't match your input model. And so trying to understand what's going on here is something um, I've been looking at, and I think, and this is just done with 3D code because I'm doing a bit of 3D inversion code and see if you can get a better result from that. Um, the answer is no, it does it as well as 2D code. Uh, obviously this conductive block is slightly offset further down, but that's just a product of um, vertical resolution of the in inverted um, model. So this is essentially all the same response. Um, and it's it's this. Um, so the, the, the problem in terms of interpreting basement is that this is a really huge conductivity change here. You go from 6,500 ohm meters to 29,000 ohm meters if you believe the logs. Like this is a huge change, you would expect that you'd be able to see um, something, but you see nothing. Part of this is a colour stretch problem. If you're interested, I can show you different colour stretches that do pick out your basement better than this does. Um, but it, at least at, at a bare minimum, we can think, well, if this is my model and this is fairly typical geology of the area, and this is what I get out of my inversion, 
I won't interpret basement here, I'll interpret it a bit below. So it's kind of like a, a guide to interpretation of the real inversions rather than any sort of quantitative um, answer. So, yes, again, which is which through that one very quick. So that that's kind of no, but I'm so if I understood you properly, okay, so you do you've got a synthetic, yep, generate your 1D data, yep, and then you go ahead and you invert it, yeah, with a 1D code, yeah, you don't get out quite the resolution that you expect, and so. Then you use the same data and you go, you invert it with a 2D code? Yeah. Uh, yeah, for me that's a little bit of a disconnect because if I'm, if you're working in 1D, I mean, at least you have the right physical model for what your data are. And then the fact that you're not getting, you know, as good a result out as you were hoping, uh, I mean, that could be because of you know, what frequencies you're using or what regularization you're, yeah. you're using. I mean, there's all kinds of issues, but I, I can't see that if you can't if you can't get out a good result with a 1D inversion on a 1D model, mm. that somehow going to, well, let me try a 2D model, uh, that somehow doesn't seem like... Well, the, the thinking there is that the... So... You're right, you're right. The 1D code should pick out this model, but it doesn't. And so my working hypothesis is that it's it's the way the inversion code searches model space that doesn't allow it to converge to the right solution. Are you just looking at, what what is your 1D inversion? Is it just a, 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 a small number of layers? I can't yeah, so this green one is, I think, Eight layers, so I tried eight layers, I tried so eight layers for this model was the minimum number of layers that it would converge at. And then I tried nine layers and I tried ten layers. So we tried all the and then up to say a hundred layers. So I this blue line here is hundred layers. So I've given it minimum number of properties that it can change and then maximum and then Nowhere in between does it resolve the resistivity structure. So, when you give it a hundred layers, mm -hmm. then there's two things. One is what regularization function is used to actually uh, control the character of that model. I would have to pick it up. Um, so it, it's the one D Occam inversion. If you're familiar with that, um, so basically I, get a smoothest model. Yeah, that's that pretty much what it is. So then the next question is like, whether you have sufficient frequencies in there that you could you know, expect to get uh, resolution of your 1,400 meters. Mm. So you need to have you know, quite a few different frequencies. Yeah, so the frequency band for the synthetic data was the same as the collected AMT data. Um, so it's directly comparable. So it goes from 10,000 hertz down to one hertz with five um, five frequencies per decade. So it, it's, it should have enough information. My suspicion is, so this this model here. Sorry, could you use the same frequency for the treaty? Yes. And uh, that is like a, a mesh you got it from the set, right? You produce your meshes. Uh, I, so you had a big, like a cube or something? Yeah, it? yeah, I made a cube around the cells. Uh, with like a uh, top layer 55 and you go yeah yeah, yeah. so Same thing. yeah I, I you can you can see the grid here so the 2d inversions have been run with fairly fine vertical mesh but the 3d inversion by its nature how about the, the standard model the resistivity uh, you give eight layers or nine layers how about the conductivity is the half space all you give? Yeah, so the starting half space for the 1D models. Oh, 1D inversion? Uh, oh, sorry, yeah, the 1D inversion. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, so. They were all started from the same um, half space resistivity, that was 100. So hundreds. nine layers, also the half space resistivity? Yeah. 
Yeah. And how, how about the 3D version? Use? Same. I use the same starting half space yeah, for all yeah. of these models and the same data set for all the models. The only thing I varied was the code. Yeah. Is, the, is the real observed data 3D? Is real observed data 3D? No. So the real observed data for the AMT um, is 1D um, for at least the, uh, it's 1D to about 100 hertz and then from 100 hertz down it's more two dimensional as you hit basement essentially. And then for the broader data set it's predominantly 2D and there's a little bit of 3D in one area. But for the frequency range I'm working with it's 1D or 2D. And so that's why initially it was inverted with two dimensional code for the real data because there's two dimensional basement. So th th this is really interesting and you know, there's enough to talk about here that could actually go for quite a time, but I <laughs> yeah. think we can't do that. But the, you know, the one thing that we can do, uh, so uh, just put together a tutorial for 1D magnetic telluric problem for the forward modeling and inversion. Mm. So over the lunch hour, we could parameterize your problem, okay, and put it into the into the tutorial, right? Mm. And see, okay, when we get out, that would be really interesting, that, right? Yeah. I mean, that would be a good lunch hour. Thing. Yeah. So Sorry. I suspect that the reason that none of these inversions actually fit very well is because all the MT inversions are parameterized to have smoothing. Um, and different layer levels of smoothing, you can turn off smoothing between layers, but then you're introducing bias to the model. And I don't have enough information here to introduce that bias, not in a way that's sensible. Um, in, a, in a real world, obviously in my synthetic model, I could introduce bias exactly where it should be, and then I'd get beautiful data fits, and it would spit out the model perfectly, but that doesn't really accomplish anything. Um, so I, I suspect if Something I've been thinking about is because if I had a 1D inversion that could say I want five blocks, you can change where the boundaries of these blocks are, like a PMG style inversion, which is a geometrical inversion instead of a property inversion, I think you get a better result here. But yeah, anyway. But you can also change regularization blocks. You can, you can. So, so there's a lot of things that could be done, and, and maybe we can. Um, yeah. Do that, but do a bit of exploring over lunch mm -hmm. and then take a look at how the kind of Lindsay can kind of walk through the tutorial and then we could actually use this as an example and see you know I think that would be really I, think I have all the data with me so we can do that definitely. Um, so yeah this this is a, the core of a paper I'm writing up at the moment trying to tell people about and so I, I do have two other models that are similar but distinct, um, which uh, I didn't show. Um, so that's kind of the basins component, and this is the work I've been doing for the full, um, the broader scale structure inversions. So um, essentially what we did is we took um, all the stations for the project area, which is 809 <coughs> stations, and trying to run an inversion on 809 stations in 3D for MT is a stupid task, so we didn't do it. Um, we subsampled it back to 10 kilometer station spacing, and that made it a much more manageable task. And when we're looking for deep structures, that's fine. Um, so obviously, I've only included depth slices from 13 kilometers because that's where the resolution of the data kind of kicks in. Um, so, what we did is we did a standard completely unconstrained model with the data um, and this is what falls out of the end of it. Um, it's a pretty interesting looking thing. Um, if you overlay geology on this you can start to make interpretations but it's still an unconstrained model. It could be it's only one of potentially hundreds, thousands, infinite models. So we're like well there's a number of features here that are really unsettling like this feature here and this one here because this boundary here is where the data stops. So obviously the version is cramming all of the conductive structure where the data isn't, which is not ideal. Um, so we restarted this unconstrained inversion with just brute force removing these conductive features to see if they're actually needed, because it could just be artifacts. Um, and then set the inversion running again 
Uh, this feature comes back, but this feature doesn't come back. So these, these aren't real, this might be. And so you end up with a model that has a number of features you're much more comfortable with it because it doesn't have the edge effects, but this is still an unconstrained model. So what do you do to determine if this is your best model? Um, so then what we did is we started looking at varying the input models to try and explore what other potential models are out there. Um, this was a reasonably unsuccessful model. What we did is we essentially broke up the model space into three domains. These are geologically defined domains based on fault blocks. So this is the Leichhardt River domain, this is the Leichhardt River fault trough, and this is um, essentially the Northern Territory component of the project area and set inversion running and turned off um, smoothing between layers. So internally, the model had to satisfy smooth inversion for a block, but it could have discontinu discontinuities between blocks. But the idea that you have, you know, blocks that behaved as single entities and then you get a nice model. Instead, what happens is it crams all your conductive structure against that place where there's no penalty for putting it, which is a ridiculous model. So are you close to water somehow? Does it have effect? Yeah, so the Georgina River runs through here. Um, it, this data is subset back to frequencies below 10 seconds. So it's quite deep data. Um, so it's possible that you would, I, I think I've removed the effects of the Jordana River system because it's quite shallow, but... What's the longest period? That What's answer? your longest period of shallow and smallest frequency? The longest period is 23,000, no, 2,300 yeah. seconds. Yeah, so it's, it's quite a long period. Um, and then probably stop because I'm sure people are bored of this. Um, the final one <laughs> that I did was, again, for anyone not familiar with MTDA, I think we've zipped over this one quite quickly. So instead of inverting the impedance data, you can also invert the tipper data, which is the vertical magnetic data. Um, and so what we did was, the, the, the benefit of inverting the tipper data is it's a simpler story. Um, it's, uh, by its nature, it, averages things into larger packages where it'll point at conductive features or resistive features. Um, so what we did is instead of starting with the impedance data and then running an inversion, we started with the tipper data, run an inversion. These, I mean, this, this inversion is not dissimilar to this inversion in terms of these sorts of orientation structures are still here, um, but it's much simpler and more coherent. Um, so start with tipper and then after you, that's run to completion you introduce your impedance data and see if it'll fit and it does. Um, so this this is our preferred model at the moment and we're working with that one incorporating the full data set to run a full inversion to see if anything changes. But essentially, oh that's awful. Um, the only way to really compare the models and see if they're as valid as each other or, or if one's more sensible than the others is to look at how they fit the data because it's possible that you have the same RMS but one just fits one component of the impedance tensor and just is awful on something else. So you compare each component of the impedance tensor um, for each model with the RMS at each period, if that makes sense. I've looked at these plots a lot, so they make sense to me, but if you've got questions, just stop me. Um, but essentially, for all the models that we've run, the fits are pretty pretty similar for each component. There's a couple, so the, the, obviously the pink and the green model are worse than the other ones. So the pink model is the one with geological units that we broke it up into pieces, and the green model is not one I've shown, but it, it's it's rotating data instead of normal data. Um, anyway, 
Uh, I might leave it there, <laughs> getting some blank looks. Um, ask your questions either here or come and talk to me. I can give you more information. So you demonstrated your MT version, this very starting model. Yep. Have you tried a starting model that just has a, the basement input? So you have an idea of where the basement is based on local group. Yeah. I mean, that should be pretty easy to input uh, in, and constrain the starting model on that way. Yeah, so you could. You absolutely could. Um, I. We don't have that good an idea where the basement is. So there's only there's only these guys and that one. This one doesn't hit basement. That's at basically 100 meters. So to pin an entire inversion on five or six basement intercepts is a bit. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not saying pin it. I'm saying treat it as a starting model. Let the data change it. Yeah, let's see. If, Versus if, a half space. If you do that, if you do do that, it's possible to do that, but you're biasing the model in a way that, because of the the way inverted yeah, is, it will give you that answer. So if your input model is wrong, you're not any better off than if you started with a half space. You're just wrong in a different way. You know some basement, or you know some certain volume, or you know some control. But this information you start model. After that, then you have to see sometimes you only see from surface of few hundred meters, but then now you want to build the crust structure. Once you do that, you basically force your your model build that way. Then you got some structure in the crust, pop pop public bottom drawn. That's the dangerous sense that we don't know how we can mm. clean this because we can, every time we have this problem we face, should we put this information to construct the model or not? Yeah, I don't have an answer. Thank you. Very unstable. Yeah. 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 It's a big side for it. It's a big side So I've worked a bit with MT on the oil side of the business. And I can tell you, we always constrain the starting model. Yeah, I mean, we <laughs> have yeah, yeah, shadow, shadow, and that's this way you go because we know a lot of information. I see the other class structure. Uh, that's the best one. Yeah. Okay, I get you know that you're a physicist, and you want to know, tell you. You've seen that they say, like, they ask you all the time. And you get too fast to this. Engineer says score, the geologist says 3.8, and the physicist says, How do you want to tell you how much is too fast? What do you want to hear? I just think, is, you know, given the resolution of MT oh. and, and, your, and your expanding grid as you go down, the cell sizes, that possibly inputting you know, a basement horizon in your starting model and allowing the data to change that might be something to consider versus a homogeneous task. Yeah, yeah, you're right. It, it is a good idea. But I would want to have a better feel for what the resistivity of the input space and layers are to do that because, I mean, if you're going to, if you're going to, so are you talking about putting in a resistivity structure that resembles the basement, uh, so basins, right. or so putting in a discontinuity. Space. So I don't know what your basement is. Just call it a kilometer. Say yeah. a half space above, you know, the, the, the pseudo basement starting model horizon is one ohm. Yeah. And below one kilometer depth, it's a thousand ohm. Might be an example. Yeah. 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 So it's, because yeah. yes, it is very starting model. Yeah, it's not necessarily a problem to do it that way. It's just not something I've done, right? So I could. I'm telling you, that, that's um, standard practice with the MT data that I've worked with. Okay. Hang on, hang on, hang on. So how many um, presentations do we have? Yeah, I took all the time. Sorry. Uh, there... <laughs> <laughs> 
So these are duplicates. So I believe there's probably six or seven more. Yeah, so we'll make sure that we take some time to actually go through the MT tutorial because we do actually have um, a set of notebooks set up to actually play with all these parameters and see what you get as an inversion result. Um, so you can go and tinker and try some things out as well. My suggestion is that maybe we try to do two more uh, hopefully short presentations and, <laughs> and then we can go for a lunch and then we'll come back and finish them up because we you know, we have some tutorials, and there is actually a lot of stuff left that we could, you, you might potentially benefit from. So let's try to ma maximize uh, your benefit for the time that's expended. So, uh, yeah, why don't we do a couple more presentations? Sounds good. Or, or just go, since Jane is uh, already talking about the MT, I'll start uh, continue my MT part. So, just uh, <laughs> GA, GA. So this this is your clicker. Yeah. This one you back and first, and then you want to be done with the laser pointer. Okay. Uh, I'll just say, give a quick view of doing the MT part because we work for the resource division of GeoSense. Geosense Australia, mainly we focus on seismic and MT, but today I'll just talk about the MT part. Uh, that is the MT technique we use for last dec decade. Last 10 years, we collected around about 4,000 stations in Australia. Uh, total, do anyone know the total number of stations in Australia we have in MT? That is about 7,500 stations in Australia. You can see J collected about 4,000 other from academics and industry. So we use this technique to start the cover sickness crust and the list of architecture. J also lead the OSLAM. OSLAM, this project is a national collaboration project. You can see the black lines, all the transects we have done. This is the large, the longest, uh, this is the longest survey I've done, about 1,200 kilometers long. This, oh, sorry, Simpson just talking about this one. It's the largest survey in Australia, probably that's more than southern station in one single survey. Okay. What we're we doing, we use the MT help to doing the pre-drilling program. What we what we did, sorry, we just go to the field. Once we know where we're going to drill in the hole, we put the audio MT, collect the one station. We use the, this mountain color chain, this approach to reverse jump. Then we're doing quick 1D inversion. As you can see, this is in New South Wales. We estimate this one is, the basement is about 280 to 300 meters. Then the data actually drilling is 295. That's pretty close, pretty good. Uh, this is we run million different inversion, try to find the average model. This is the one approach. We're also doing 2D. So this is in uh, South Australia. We estimate this one, we collect the few, few stations across the drilling side, then we're doing 2D model. What we found out is this one, we estimated the basement is 370 to 400 meter. You can clearly see this one, this limestone, we know this sediment, Buchan basin, then we know this one. Actually, the drilling just finished one and a half months ago, that is 376 meters in depth. So we still hitting the target limit. So it's quite interesting. This will probably help with some if some industry can use this technique, basic audio MT. Then we're doing a lot of regional MT survey. Uh, you can see this the one. Since we're doing MT model and the deep refraction seismic survey, we put them together, you can see quite nice correlation. This have a high reflectivity, high resistivity. 
same again in this we can see some boundary this kind of feature we see all the show in empty then we put the interpretation we know this office basin then there's a big four major four in here this major electric boundary between you you go you gun crap and the mass grab elements then you see quite interesting the empty certain show some interesting feature we also doing some 3d region the survey before people already show you some so what is next program is we doing the offline mass we know this uh, we aim to produce 3d conductive map and also doing some geoelectric heat my colleague will show them about this one. So we're going to collect about 3,000 sites across Australia. Each dose is one point. So far, we collect about 800 sites. That's all the red one have been completed. We currently kind of completed this box. Right now, our field crew is collect the data in here. Once the finish put this station by next week, we've completed this red box. So that's about 120 station we finish. Our target is in next three years, we finish this, all of these blackboard points. That's a lot, lot of money going to put in, about nine million, something like that. That's what we're going to do. This is a few, you can see some equipment. Okay, this, what we're doing in the Auslan, I'll just show you a quick model. We found it quite interesting. This the gold the gold deposit, all the state above the conductor or in the edge of the conductor. This kind of feature give you not a detailed feature, but it give you roughly the industry where you're looking for the mineral results. That's our goal. So but we have a lot of issues. We see some success marking the basement and the list of architecture, but the interpretation is hard because they really require a lot of different knowledge, like petrology, geochemics. So how we link all of this kind of stuff? We think about the joint inversion or some dynamic or with the geophysic this joint inversion that we try to push for, but that still in work progress. And we also found that, that MP pretty much is the, is the academic player. We don't have the really sophisticated tool for extracting information quickly, like a, from a data process, modeling, or data analysis. We need, really need this kind of tool so we can move around quickly. The next problem is the current 3D emotion is not not capable of doing solve of the large scale problem. We collect so many sites, how we can model them together. So current is minor two things. One requires big memory. Second is the computation time is intense, require a lot of time. Uh, some is related to the code design, like a, for example, now is so the code we use is a one master CPU hold all the information together. Then each other CPU we use 200, 300 CPU. Other CPU only use a little bit of memory and the calculate pretty fast. But once the forward to master CPU, this one does hold every information. Then require a lot of memory and. Uh, calculation is very slow. So we think about it is possible to split the split the different uh, the different frequency to individual CPU that doing complete the task individual. The issue is how we communicate between the different CPU. Oh is that model EM that does that? Oh uh, it's model EM. Oh, that's that way. So once you get larger you have this problem. problem. Thank you. So that's why if you help the academic work can help us out. We have pretty much an application of academic. Yeah. All right. Thanks. So I'll stop. Uh, if you have any question, I'll stop here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. no. No. Actually, I have another question. So, when, when is Oslo um, scheduled to be complete and when are they to 
or we we have quite a time we finish each one survey like each one step we release one step we complete we release we hope to finish in next five to ten years something like that <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Lachlan from RMIT University, I'm doing a PhD with James McNay, and uh, the topic is uh, audio frequency magnetotellurics with uh, lightning network data. So uh, there's a variety of uh, commercial networks that are detecting where and when uh, lightning is occurring uh, globally 24-7. And they're also giving us the current in the lightning strike. So from that, um, here we can see a bunch of lightning strikes occurring. Um, and I've drawn a propagation path between the uh, one lightning strike here and our survey site down in uh, down near Heathkit, Victoria. Uh, so we can start to predict things using this information, um, such as uh, the arrival uh, azimuth. So from that, we can work out which way the electric and magnetic field vectors are pointing when they come into our, uh, our survey site. Uh, and so as this spheric comes in, it interacts with the geology and uh, the conductors in the ground, and the fields can rotate around. And so using this lightning data, we can work out a reference to see how much uh, the uh, Earth is rotating the fields. Um, now, because the spheric travels at the speed of light, and we know these two points on the curve, we can work out an arrival time, and we can precisely extract the exact uh, portion of data with the spheric in it uh, and tie it to its, um, uh, its lightning parameters. Um, so there have been a few areas of research that we've looked at, um, increasing signal-to-noise ratios, um, looking for Schumann resonances and extracting those using their spatial and temporal uh, dependences. Um, we've looked at observing static shift directly through the rotation of electric fields that occurs and um, anomalous magnetic fields. So here I'm showing some magnetotelluric time series data. At the top we have the electric field component and the bottom we have the uh, magnetic field component. And I've shown lightning strike times along the center here and linked them to some of the uh, spherics in the data. Um, Notice that the spherics are very uh, short-lived events. Uh, they have huge amounts of signal, um, and that the data in between the spherics is actually close to the noise level of the sensors. Now we're going to focus in uh, specifically on a couple of spherics. On the left, we're looking at the source that's around 600 kilometers away from our survey site. Uh, had an exceptionally large peak current of 100,000 amps or thereabouts. And um, we can see that it has a huge amount of signal from up above 10 kilohertz right down to a couple of hundred hertz. Over on the right, we're looking at a strike that's occurred over in uh, uh, 3,000 kilometers away from the survey site. And due to the greater propagation distance, the uh, amplitudes have decreased quite a lot due to attenuation in the Earth ionosphere waveguide. There's also a uh, lack of signal in this band between 1.5 and 5 kilohertz, which is called a dead band, and that's a big problem for audio frequency magnetotellurics. Uh, if you notice up here, I've got a couple of polar plots that are showing expected um, azimuths for the field vectors in green and the uh, measured um, vectors up here uh, blue. So I'm going to go for a very quick um, uh, demo here. Um, so what I'm showing is uh, parent resistivity and phase curves. These have been computed on uh, continuous data segments. There's about 10 trials of two-minute uh, data segments. And what you can see is there's this trough uh, between 1.5 and 5 kilohertz, which is due to that dead band. Uh, basically, we just don't have, we have very poor signal-to-noise ratio, so the data are biased. So what I've done is I've looked at the lightning network data, I've picked out sources that are close to our survey site, I've picked sources with uh, high peak currents, then I've stitched each spheric together into a time series 
put it uh, into the bounded influence remote reference processing code, the same as I had done for the continual segments. And we can see that the error bars have decreased quite a lot, uh, and also that the trunk <coughs> is no longer there, so the data are no longer biased due to the very large uh, signal amplitudes that we have to use. Now this really helps with the uh, imaging of the subsurface because um, if we think about the dead band in terms of skin depths, uh, for the uh, high frequency, we get down to around uh, 15 meters. For the, for the lower frequency end of the dead band, we're looking at around uh, 1.5 kilohertz. We're getting to a skin depth of approximately 50 meters. So this area in gray is something uh, that is biased and hard to resolve from uh, the original data that I showed off the conventional processing scheme, which is shown here in black. Um, the higher signal to noise ratio data shown in red uh, are much smoother and we were able to fit uh, this model here, which we are now able to um, confidently resolve uh, layers within this uh, depth range uh, and within the areas of our data. So we've got a couple of publications out um, on the uh, methodology of predicting uh, the lightning strikes and the spherics in the data and uh, also on observing and correcting for static shift. And there are some more publications to come, so uh, stay tuned. Thanks. That was very nice. Thank you. Can you go back to the slide where you had the apparent resistivities? Uh, show. Yeah, so that guy there. So in the dead band, like, mm. Well, why is it biased down? I mean, uh, why not just have larger errors? What's actually causing bias? Well, most of the data, as you see on uh, this earlier plot, are sitting on the noise level of our uh, sensor. So the processing code sees most of these quiet bits, and the specs are only a very small fraction of the total amount of data that it gets to use. Mm -hmm. and so when, it, when, when you go through all the processing, um, you're, looking, you're basically looking at a consistent noise level all the time. So that gives you this sort of this fake power resistivity that just sits around down here at these frequencies and up here at those. And it has no relevance to the ground at all. So when you put in very high signal, you get the proper diffusion in the ground and you can, you can see it through the higher signal. So is that then, uh, could you actually follow why it's biased by really understanding how the processing is being done and kind of looking at, okay, this kind of characteristic of noise, I'm going to probably do a cross correlation of something in there uh, and, and kind of figure out like, okay, if I'm making this assumption, uh, then this is actually going to cause things to bias down. Um, well, I think the best thing to, I mean, with the, the, the big problem with um, the AMT is that people have always assumed while the sources are all random, we don't really know about them, so we'll just pretend that they're sort of there and it's all sort of going to work yeah. out. And what I think people need to start doing is sort of more data adaptive stuff and considering source information and pulling out the where you've got the signal and working with that only and, and moving away from the conventional sort of um, read for you know, 30 minutes and... and um, Front use a whole lot, but I don't know if I'm answering your question exactly. Well, I guess it's coming back to a theme that we've uh, kind of had as we're going around. It, it, it turns out that the MT problem is something that resonates irrespective of where we're going. And as I've mentioned before, um, this whole business of going from your time series to impedances. Uh, you know, a, a lot of people feel like, well, that's a done deed. There's Gary Apert's code and there's Alan Chase. Those are the two most common codes around. They're, they're used. Uh, but a lot, most people don't really understand exactly what they're doing. Yeah. And if, if that's the case, then it's really easy to get some numbers out that really aren't quite that's right. what you're looking for. And also, you don't know how to how to change things. Yeah. The codes. Yeah. You know. So what we're... What we're trying to get promote here is a, a bit of an open source community that would look at that, just at that problem of yep. going from your time series to your final impedances, really break it open so that it could understand 
what is happening, and uh, then be able to change things. And within yeah. that context, it kind of becomes my sort of my question: if you know, could we understand where in the processing scheme something happens to actually make it go bias down? I mean, why not bias up? Why not just have large error bars? I mean, it's, I don't know where that's where that's coming from. The, the way I say it is, it's consistent noise levels, and they're just. You got. If you think of it simplistically, you've got an E upon H ratio, and if they're sort of just noise and sort of stationary noise, they're always sort of doing the same thing at the same sort of frequency. That's why there's such consistency in that other slide. So um, that's just the way I've thought of it. Um, and what you really, yeah, what you really need to be doing is looking for your signals. And, yeah. So if you go back to your signal, just a, is it, um. There was a spike, is that when you process, um, do they still survive or it just... Um, um, the way I set it up is that they absolutely survive, that, that, that they're, they're absolutely paramount to the whole thing. Um, this is, it's, it's using the same um, processing code with the same parameters in both examples. It's just that um, the spherics, because they're so short-lived, they're sort of being washed out by all the other data. So. Use the pattern chains. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it, yeah. it's a very good code. I'm, I just, yeah, there's no issues with the code. It's just the way that we're using it. It's not very civilized. <laughs> yeah. So well, very, Al, Alan's a really bright guy. He spent a lot of time putting that, that stuff together. There's a lot of really sophisticated mathematics yeah. that goes yeah. back in, and it's all captured in a code that he really understands, but not necessarily everybody else who's using it. Yeah, I mean, that, and that's that's fine, but that's limiting also. Yeah, no, it's a great code. Um, yeah, you need to start incorporating source information. There's so many other benefits I can't really get into in five minutes, but um, you know, correcting for static shifts has been pretty exciting. There's a publication out in the Geophysical Journal International on that. Um, by you? Yeah, by me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. So lunch is out, I suggest we go eat. Um, <laughs> yeah, we need to send a little something together.